sunburn to peel the daggers off your tongue Young and dumb, I'm rotting like a bed sore In a cold case that's never gonna be more than scratching at the walls While you're waiting for a bullet to come All along I've been treading in the deep end Throw my mirror in the cupboard for the weekend Try and put together pieces while I'm dreaming But nothing's adding up to a thing but a hole in the head Yes, they are mine. So now to the merchant ships. Minutes after they took I from the bottomless pit, my hand was made strong by the hand of the Almighty. We forward in this generation. Triumphantly, won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? It's all I ever held. Redemption songs, redemption songs. Pain yourselves from mental slavery None but ourselves can free our minds Oh, have no fear for atomic energy Cause none of them can stop the time How long 
shall they kill our prophets? Wow, well, stand aside and up. Some say it's just part of it. Got to fulfill the book. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? So all I ever have Redemption songs Redemption songs Redemption songs Pain yourselves from mental slavery None but ourselves can free our minds Oh, have no fear for atomic energy Cause none of them can stop the time yeah, How long shall they kill our prophets? Wow, I stand aside and look Some say it's just a part of it Got to fulfill the book Won't you help to sing These songs of freedom It's all I ever have Redemption songs Redemption songs It's all I Redemption songs Redemption songs Redemption songs Hey, what's up, troops? Jeff Evely, the magnanimous Gen Xer male, back with you now on this fourth day of April 2023, and I practice radical candor. I think I was just making it in the nick of time there to get my banner up, so <laughs> pardon me for the slightly delayed response here. Garbad over on Rumble, the first one on the board says, Good day, Sergeant Major. Keep up the great work. Don't mind if I do. Thank you very much for the support. And Rob K is there saying, now, Good afternoon, evening, everyone. Giving us the victory, Maple Leaf, and the triple slashy right back at you, brother, and I appreciate you as well. And uh, we got Patricia over here on Facebook saying good evening, everyone, and giving us the hearts, Canada hearts. And, uh, oh, there's Rob. He's everywhere. He's over there on YouTube as well. Good afternoon slash evening all. <laughs> right on, Rob. And uh, Colleen says, uh, good evening, freedom lovers. Hello, Colleen. Nick Larker is giving us a triple slashy. Welcome aboard, brother. And Cindy says, good evening, Jeff, giving us the hearts. Uh, good day, everyone. Smiley face. Uh, Cindy, thanks for always being with us. Marion and with us as always as well says, good evening, everyone, and gives us the hearts. And Brenda says, good evening, all. Gives us smiley face and a triple slashy thanks for being with us and uh mike is here saying howdy how do you do brother and uh colleen says tonight i'm having dinner and a show nice okay so you guys uh hopefully the regulars don't mind the new time slot actually the new old time slot because i started out in the evenings and then i went to the mornings and then i tried the noon hour and now i'm back in the evenings i think um this is probably where i'm gonna stay maybe it was just meant to be that way uh gerald says hi hey how you doing and uh let me see Ash is here saying Hey, you filthy heathens, P.S. Jeff, if you should do a cover of Sound of Silence by Disturbed, uh, was listening to it today. I have been told that. some, uh, uh, A few people have actually requested that I do a cover of that. I don't know. It, it, uh, it might be tough to pull off just on the acoustic. I mean, he's got like the freaking uh taiko drums and all this stuff in that one there um i don't know but i'm, I'm just kind of a solo acoustic guy so uh, maybe there's something i could do with it i have to get pretty damn creative though odst <laughs> 0922 gives us a triple slashy and christine is here saying hello triple slashy giving us the uh the wave hey how you doing and uh fymm we all know what that means it says uh 
Click like and share, share, share. Yes, please. I could use all the help that I can get. I'm told it helps the algorithm, so please do that. And uh, Andrew's here saying, hey, Jeff Avely. Hey, what's up, Andrew? Thanks, brother, for being with us. Okay, let's dive into it, everybody. Here is our philosophy quote for the day. This is Epictetus, and he is something like one of the OGs of, um, of uh, Stoicism. Um, you know, uh, Zeno is really the OG. He's kind of the father of uh, Stoicism, but but Epictetus, um, very widely cited, especially by Marcus Aurelius, who is my boy, whom I'm always plugging around here. Uh, read the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, and you will feel better. And um, Marcus actually refers to Epictetus probably more than all of the other um, all of the other uh, quoted philosophers combined. Um, so yeah, he is uh, the real deal. And he says, the greater the difficulty, the more glory in surmounting it. Well, we have an awful lot of glory ahead of us here in Canada, because uh, as everyone can see by now, I'm sure. Well, not everyone. Everyone around here can see. We have some uh, great difficulties that lie ahead. Um, we're stacking up a few wins early here in 2024, but we're not out of the woods yet. So uh, prepare yourselves for the great difficulty. But just remember that great glory lies on the other side. Okay. Here is our meme for the day, and this is actually uh, Justin Trudeau's alter ego on uh, X, and he's got a blue check mark somehow. So um, he's uh, he's pretty awesome, and he has a picture of Justin Trudeau. This is presumably from the school at which he taught. This uh, circuit, this uh, picture was circulated quite a bit. He's got his uh, arm. Uh, around a couple of ladies. He's in a picture with like four ladies and a couple of dudes in the back. So four ladies are up front and he's got his arm around a couple of them. Uh, you know, I mean, hand maybe a little too high on the midriff there for uh, a grown ass man to, uh, you know, to be interacting with his students that way. But um, the one who purportedly got the $2.5 million payout is apparently right there on his right. Um, and Justin Trudeau's alter ego is saying, back when I was a teacher, I spent a lot of my own money to keep students' mouths full. <laughs> Think of the children. Oh, yes. Yeah, everybody is um, uh, hell in love joy these days. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, that is our cuttlefish cry minister, everybody. Uh, okay. So what do we got here? Oh, here we go. Here's Ian Miles Chong. And he is uh, tweeting out a clip of Jimmy Kimmel here. And he says, Jimmy Kimmel says traveling to Japan made him realize how, quote, filthy and disgusting the U.S. By, the US is by comparison. He's not wrong. Um, OK, I'm going to let him say this. Let's uh, let's put Jimmy on here and then we'll talk a little bit uh, about why he's not wrong. Traveling to Japan, I realized that this place, this USA we're always chanting about, is a filthy and disgusting place. <laughs> We were in Japan for seven days. Not only did I not encounter a single dirty bathroom, the bathrooms in Tokyo and Kyoto are cleaner than our operating rooms here. <laughs> Everywhere you go, the bathrooms are clean. They don't smell bad. They have those toilets that wash you from the inside out. <laughs> Just in a hotel, restaurants, bars, truck stops. I went to two truck stops. I swear to God, the bathrooms cleaner than Jennifer Garner's teeth. The cleanest, <laughs> beautiful. And it's not just the bathroom. There's no litter. They clean up after themselves. They bring their garbage to their houses. And it's like the whole country is Disneyland and we're living at Six Flags. This uh, talk show host Jimmy Kimmel later said, quote, we are like hogs compared to the Japanese, close quote, and wondered what they think of Americans. traveling to japan I re yeah okay so he's gross um i think that was patricia who pointed that out initially so good job on that patricia um not that i did not know it already yeah jimmy kimmel is just a really? human being um so yeah he says that uh uh he says that the united states is a filthy and disgusting country compared to uh japan for all the reasons that he just gave like the garbage and uh general cleanliness and vagrancy lack of vagrancy over there in uh in japan but let's check out what's going on with japan here guys so here i have macro trends um and this is japan net migration for 1950 to 2024 this is one of those things you see japan they don't have to be woke um they're, they're <laughs> their their history is about as imperialist as it gets um and i don't think that they need to self-flagellate over their colonialist past um because here is their net migration and uh Let's see, for 2021, it was 0.534 per thousand population. And it went up a little bit to 0.525, then 
down to 5.516. And it currently sits at 0.489 per 1,000 population. And that's a 5.2 per 3% decline from 2023. So in 2024, um, I, uh, as you can see, this is consistent with the previous years. It's like a half a percentage. Okay. So they have a half a percentage for um, per thousand population or a half a person basically is what this means is they get half an immigrant for every 1000 population um, in uh, in the four previous years here that's being shown. Now, let's look at the net U.S. migration. Um, so same statistic. Now, remember, they have a half a person for every 1000 that comes into um, into Japan. And here is the United States. So they have uh, 2.8 in 2020. 2.7 in 2021, 2.7 in 2022, and then 2.7, uh, a little bit higher, 768 per, uh, for 2023. Um, so that is uh, like more than five times the amount of immigration um, in, uh, in the United States per capita that they're taking in um, relative to Japan. Now, and that is the thing, like Japan is incredibly ethnically homogenous. Um, I'm not even sure if we could become citizens there. I think it's pretty tough uh, to do that. But and, you know, they have the same kind of demographic crisis crisis that we're going through uh, as well. Like they have a baby boomer generation that's just about to retire and it's going to be uh, uh, a catastrophe for their social services because they don't have enough young people really to support the system. So they got the same problem that we have here. And that is the reason, as far as I can tell, um, one of the main driving reasons, at least why we have to import um, hordes of people uh, from all over the world. It's in order to support this Ponzi scheme of a Canada pension plan that we have that's currently running over a trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities right when the boomer generation is about to punch out. So I think there's a bit of a panic to bring in enough people to uh, finance that Ponzi scheme. But, um, you know, that's uh, that's just me. I'm not an economist, nor am I economist adjacent. Um, but they are running over a trillion dollars enough in the liabilities, and they do not report that to uh, Parliament. It doesn't go into their parliamentary report. And speaking of Canada, here's Canada net migration rate. And uh, so uh, just to refresh, in Japan, there's a half a person per thousand people coming in every year. In the United States, there's a little over two and a half people, almost three people per 1,000 population coming in. And here in Canada, we have six. It's over six people per 1,000 population. So that is double the rate per capita. That is over double the rate per capita of the United States. And it's like 12 times the rate, the per capita rate of Japan. So um, yeah, that's Canada, everybody. And uh, you know, I think that means we're in a hell of a lot of trouble. We're gonna, we're gonna slide down this decline a hell of a lot faster. Um, we might be a little behind the curve with the, the relative to the Americans. Like uh, we're basically one election cycle behind the Americans and further down the road to serfdom. Um, so, uh, you know, Trudeau is something like our Obama regime. Um, he came much later. Well, not terribly later than Obama, but one election cycle. Right. And uh, it's all the same progressive wokeness and stuff like that. So a lot of this stuff started under Obama and uh, Trudeau is trying to out Obama, Obama. And so um, now we have six people per thousand population coming in uh, 2020. Three, yeah, um, all these years. And that again is 12 times the per capita rate of Japan and twice the per capita rate, so two and a half times the per capita rate of the US. Okay, so here's Ian Miles Chung, and he says, Listen to this woman and how she feels unsafe because of the migrant men coming into Britain. So, this is something that we have going on all over the West. It's all part of the commie psy op to weaken the West from within. Um, and uh, They'll uh, they'll have his conquerors without even firing a shot. It's uh, part of the strategy, at least anyway. And here is uh, the same thing is going on over in Britain, where they famously have had these rape gangs, you know, like the uh, the Rotherham rape gangs, which the media reported as Asian rape gangs, but they were in fact Pakistani. Um, they're Muslim rape gangs, is what they are. But you're not going to hear the mainstream tell you that they'll. They'll try to hide that under the banner of Asian, which um, is what you're supposed to say instead of Oriental. So everybody thinks uh, Oriental when they hear that. Um, but uh, but anyway, yeah, huge problems over there in the UK. And here is a couple of talking heads on that subject. What do you think, this Alex? Is, what are you? Because you talked about this, this this morning. This is such an important issue for me because I've been living in London for 10 years. I've also lived in multiple other countries around the world. Never before have I felt as unsafe as I do now. When I walk down the street, I'm increasingly being leered at. I'm increasingly having... I'm increasingly being followed, like I'm going around the souks of Morocco. And it's not 
visibly to me anyway, people who were born and bred here. It isn't. And I, I, you know, it's very difficult because we're not allowed to talk about it because, oh my gosh, you know, that's not, that breaks taboo. Oh, you know, you're a racist if you say this. I'm sorry. A lot of women going about their daily business feel that their safety is being directly threatened by people who are coming from different cultures. And this needs to be discussed because I've had enough. All my other female friends have had enough. When I put this stuff online, the number of comments online from other women saying they've had enough and saying, thank you for talking about this. Was it not enough when we noticed what was going on with grooming gangs? Was it not enough when we see what's happened to the victim of Abdul Azadi? When are we going to have the conversation that women's safety is being mortgaged at the altar of mass immigration and this faux political correctness? And I speak to many other women who suffer the same indignities and offences like you do, who don't have a public profile, who are not in the media, and they are echoing what you are saying about the utterly unacceptable behaviour that they are being subjected to, and I keep urging them to report it. Yep. Uh, Wokeness hurts women, uh, everybody. That could have been a good title for this one as well. Uh, Wokeness hurts women. Um, So uh, just just keep that uh, in mind as we move forward here. Okay, here is Son of a Bench, and he says Trudeau is creating another program, um, Canada Builds, a $15 billion program that includes low-interest construction loans and building rental housing units. Yeah, they're low-interest for now, right? (laughs) Just like those low-interest mortgages. Um, The Liberals are looking to spend their way out of this mess, and um, they have cause for Canada. I I don't really know about the interest rates, by the way, but I'm just... Generational... Um, you know, obviously, uh, my current perception is based on my previous experience. And pardon me if I'm a little bit leery when uh, it comes to offers of help coming from the current regime. Here we go. The federal government, we've been taking leadership and making those generational investments to incentivize and support more supply. Housing gets built when every order of government steps up and our private sector and nonprofit partners have the right incentives to get shovels in the ground. Well, today we're announcing that upcoming budget 2024 will invest in a new initiative we're calling Canada Builds. Canada Builds is going to turbocharge affordable apartment construction in partnership with provinces and territories. It'll provide low cost loans, help speed up development and build projects at the scale necessary to meet the urgent needs of Canadians. Let me walk through the details. We're going to make a map. Okay, that's enough out of that guy. I forgot to give my Trudeau warning there. So, um, yeah, and Patricia, I saw the spammer. I think I got them. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. And uh, Colleen is saying the same thing. Yeah, that's the, the one that I got there. Terrace Bodan should be gone. Um, yeah, and Banks is pointing out that uh, give a Trudeau warning, will you, Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm breaking my own protocol here, guys. My bad. Um, but yeah, okay. So they've stolen so much money from Canadians and flooded us with immigrants so badly that nobody can afford uh, to buy a home anymore. And so now they're going to, what, what do they do? Like they're, after they've stolen all of our money and everything's a mess while well, the, uh, the answer is, um, you know, to steal more money, more taxes, more uh, socialized programs. Um, and, uh, you know, as Friedrich Hayek pointed out in The Road to Serfdom, the road to serfdom is paved through a socialist democracy. So uh, that is uh, where we're headed. All right. So now um, here is uh, them Sterry, and they're saying East Hastings Street, Vancouver, in the early 1970s and before it, uh, it began the crap it became, I think they mean, is uh, it became the crap hole it is now. So this is a pretty cool picture. This is from the 70s. Um, and, uh, this is Vancouver. And as you can see, it's nice and clean. Like people, you know, are, uh, are picking up the trash. It's not, uh, falling apart. Like Jimmy Kimmel describes, it's not uh, a filthy and disgusting country. It actually looks quite wholesome. Uh, so much so that I don't think modern Canadians can really recognize that, but, uh, yeah, that is a, a pristine city and, uh, appears to be a bustling and cosmopolitan. So, uh, that was the seventies and, Here we are now. Uh, So Tyler is saying, uh, this is Vancouver, Canada, a city that's been made part of an experiment to decriminalize drugs. Quote, drug users aged 18 and older can carry up to 2.5 grams of opioids, including fentanyl, meth, crack, heroin, morphine, ecstasy, and powder cocaine, close quote. Does decriminalizing drugs actually work when mental health treatment rehab is not made an, uh, an imminent priority? Here is what I saw walking down East Hastings neighborhood in broad daylight. So... 
This is uh, broad freaking daylight. Look at this. This is Vancouver, Canada, a city that made every drug legal. All drugs are good and balanced. Bob made all drugs. You on Trank right now? I don't know. I might be. More drugs, the better. How easy would it be for us to get like fentanyl right now? That's yeah, but we're talking about Is that meth right there in your hand? It's fentanyl and a little bit of meth. Everyone's stealing, everyone's selling their body. How much do you use in a day? Seven grams. Oh, it smokes, bro. How do you afford your drug addiction out here? Boosting. See people die out here? I have, yes. You don't know what is, what's in your dope. Everything's laced with fentanyl down here. They want to get you addicted. That's an active overdose in real time right there. This guy's wrapped in a trash can right here. We even know he's alive. I was worried about you. You're in a trash bag. Okay, just check on your brother. This is an OD. You doing okay? You guys got Narcan? Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Well, it looks like she was overdosing, and as she was overdosing, they're robbing her. How long have you been using fentanyl? No. Six plus years. So is this your buddy right here? Yeah, it's his friend. Yeah. So, okay. so he's nodding out. Is he okay? He's lying to me, I think. With the guy over here, just nodded out, passed out on the curb. Sir, are you okay? Just want to check on you. You okay, brother? Kevin's going to make sure they are alive. Hey, guys. You guys just, are you guys okay? Looks like they're both breathing. Yeah, great stuff. Okay, so um, now, um, Obviously, that is uh, more to do with uh, the kind of crackpot socialist theories around the uh, decriminalization of drugs than it is to do with immigration. But I think we're going to see that these things actually intersect. It is an intersectional hierarchy of oppression, after all. And the Marxist praxis lens through which we see the intersectional coalition forming, that of Islamunism, um, they uh, is... Uh, um, that, uh, that particular lens is intersectional. So, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see a little bit intersecting here in a minute. Okay. So here is, um, this is crime net and they're saying broad daylight shooting in downtown Vancouver. Okay. Check this out. This was, uh, this is very fresh actually. So, um, when did they post this? This is April 2nd. So this just happened the other day. Okay. If you're just listening. This guy jumps out of a car. He's stopped in traffic. He goes running up to the, the car that's at the front of the line. Two of them, two guys running up with pistols, and they're just shooting right inside the driver's window. Car smashes in. Uh, he uh, broadsides somebody else, and looks like somebody goes running in out the passenger side, and these guys are just firing their pistols down the street in broad daylight. This guy looks like he's finishing that driver off or something. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's still shooting into the, the car. Broad daylight and running away. Okay. And then they just back up and take off. So there you go. And uh, this is Lieutenant Retired LAPD Frank Colombo. I don't think that's his real name, but... Um, this is March 31st. Vancouver police uh, attended a shooting at Richards and Robinson and second shooting April 4th at Homer and West Pender. April 2nd, our mayor, Ken Sim, asked us, quote, who else is excited to enjoy the fresh air and vibrant energy of our city's outdoor spaces? Close quote. No, thanks. Too much energy for me. Um, and he's retweeting the uh, the graphic here from the, the, the pr police press release. So, uh, yeah, March 31st, uh, we have a, a shooting. And then April 2nd, there's a shooting, a uh, second shooting on April 4th. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's uh, Vancouver, I think, is a harbinger China of wants things to control to us and where you, uh, wherever you implement these woke policies, like they're just a little bit further down that road to serfdom, uh, wherever you implement these kind of policies, this uh, progressive uh, mindset, when uh, when the progressive politics seeps in there, what you see is this idle collapse. Okay. And uh, here... Let me just read the caption here. Oh, I, uh, yeah, this is um, uh, Fox News. This is from YouTube. It says, wake up. Christy Noam sends an ominous warning to Americans. Okay, so here we go. China wants to control us, and they want to do that by controlling our food supply. The Chinese Communist Party is not our friend. They're not our partner, and they're not our ally. They're our enemy. And that was South Dakota Governor Christy Noam testifying in front of the House Agriculture Committee on Capitol Hill last week on China seeking to control the entire food supply chain in the United States. China already dominates the pork industry. All of this as a new TikTok post goes viral this week, featuring a Venezuelan national with over half a million followers telling migrants who cross the United States border illegally how to seize homes in America and invoke squatters' rights to unoccupied houses in America. 
One week after the House passed a bill to ban TikTok if it does not separate itself from the Chinese parent company ByteDance, no word on whether Majority Leader Chuck Schumer will actually bring that bill up for debate in the Senate. Joining me now with more on the threat from communist China is the woman herself, South Dakota Governor Christy Noem. Governor, great to have you this morning. Thanks very much for being here. Thank, thank you for inviting me, Maria. Well, you've been adamant about protecting America's farmland, uh, certainly in your state, from mm -hmm. CCP influence. Tell us what you've seen and what kind of uh, behavior we should expect from the CCP should they own farmland in America. I agree. This anchor's voice well, what I, what is a little bit shrill, so bear with me. What I hope the American people realize is that the country that controls our food supply, they control us. And so it's incredibly important that we pay attention to what's been happening for decades. This is my 30th year of working on ag policy, food policy in the United States of America. And over those years, I've watched the CCP come in and buy up our fertilizer companies, our chemical companies. They've stolen our genetics. Uh, they've come in and bought up our processing systems. In fact, we've had programs where we've given CCP members and Chinese citizens citizenship in exchange for investment into our processing systems. And now they have dramatically increased the amount of purchases of ag land in the United States. That completes their control of our food supply chain, which means that the country that feeds us they will control us and it's a national security issue. We need to care who our neighbors are and not just because of how we feed ourselves, but also because a lot of times that ag land is right next to our national security interests. It's right next to our air bases, next to our military installations where our platforms are, where they spy and steal information from us. Well, already Hong Kong and the CCP have passed new security laws, which many say, uh, will uh, further erode civil liberties in America and any businesses mm -hmm. operating in China. Do you believe that American businesses, managers, CEOs understand the threat that you are referring to? I think they're starting to understand it, but I also think that they're under the control of the economics of doing business with China. And that's the problem is so many of our businesses have gotten so dependent and our farmers through trade agreements and exports have gotten so dependent on the market that is China and the size of it that they need to really wake up and realize who does come first. Is it America and our safety or is it the economics of really what we need to decide here we stand for. So that's what I think is so powerful about this conversation right now is that China is willing to put their people through inhumanities uh, in, in terrible situations in order to get what their agenda is. And their agenda is to become a world dominating power. Okay. Um, so a couple of things on there, of course, they're going after the food and the ag and um, the, uh, like all of this stuff, like the nitrogen, fertilizer, carbon, all this, stuff. I think it all goes back to them. Um, that appears to be the case to me. It's all part of the comic psyop to uh, weaken the West. But she's talking about the investment piece as well. Like they're buying up this land and you'll notice that she says um, they're not just buying up the agricultural land, but they're actually buying land that is close to defense facilities, right? To military facilities, um, which puts them in an ideal position to spy on the Americans. Uh, and there's 25 been 25 to 35. Oh, sorry, that one's getting away from me. There has been an awful lot of investment, Chinese investment in the left coast. Um, you'll notice that all of the worst cities are on the left coast. It's not just Vancouver, it's Seattle, it's Portland, it's San Diego, San Francisco, like uh, LA. They're all going to hell in a handbasket in a hard and fast way. Um, and uh, it, I think, has everything to do with um, Chinese interests um, on the left coast. OK, and here is uh, another video from um, from uh, YouTube. And it says Scott McGregor inside CCP hybrid warfare operations in Canada. So if you haven't read it already, I actually just finished it. I was kind of falling, but I'm always juggling books and stuff anyway here is the mosaic effect okay awesome book if you want to know what the heck is going on in canada scott mcgregor he's a canadian armed forces veteran intelligence operator so um yeah it's uh, very well sourced well researched and terrifying so um yeah here is scott mcgregor he is the author of the mosaic effect how the chinese communist party started a hybrid war in america's backyard and where's america's backyard everybody it's Canada, right? It's right here in Canada. So 
The hybrid war is here in Canada. And here is uh, Scott McGregor, author of The Mosaic Effect. 25 to 35% of the fentanyl coming to the U.S. is actually coming through the Canadian border. It's coming from the north through Vancouver. So you typically only hear about the Mexican border. Yes, the threat from Mexico has been highly publicized. There's movies about it. The El Chapo, the Sicario movie, and that kind of thing. And there has been some documentary filmmaking that explained that, yes, there's a connection between China and Mexico, and they've taught them how to do certain things, how to create fentanyl. Vancouver is known as a transshipment point, both across the Pacific to Japan, Australia and others, but also to the United States. Being able to create something in Canada with a border that is the largest undefended border in the world with our largest trading partner makes it quite easy to get that into the U.S. And there's starting to be a little more awareness. But again, enforcement in Canada, stopping it before it can get there is just not happening. Yeah. So the enforcement in Canada is not happening. Of course, we're seeing all kinds of that with um, another sham of an inquiry that's underway right now, the one on foreign interference. And, you know, they've added India and Russia to this, even though it was only leaked that uh, the intelligence agencies were worried about China. Um, so they're trying to water it down. And, um, you know, I showed some clips from it here already. And there's all kinds of stupidity going on um, even now. And it's a liberal appointee judge. Um, so, um, you know, obviously the political will to do anything about this is not there. And I believe it is because our elites are captured and they're working for China. Um, and, uh, he's talking a little bit about the fentanyl crisis there. Of course, we see that all over the left coast and there is the Mexico connection as well. They're on the program of Chinese nationals coming across the border, uh, the Southern border of the U S from Mexico, of course, but the, the fentanyl operation, it used to be the case that the Chinese would, um, ship all this fentanyl. They'd, they'd flood us with, with fentanyl, North America, that is, um, through Mexico. Uh, but uh, the U.S. got after Mexico for that for a little bit. But so now what they have is they're, they're bringing the precursors in. Like they bring all the ingredients that you need to make fentanyl, but it's not uh, assembled yet. So they have these uh, pill presses down there, Chinese pill presses, where they're making the pills um, fentanyl, you know, they're just reassembling it basically in Mexico and then shipping it across. Um, but they're absolutely flooding us. And, um, I point to the, um, it's, it's a, it's a propaganda line. I believe, uh, this whole thing about the opium wars where, uh, we've been teaching our own school children that, uh, the British forced opium on China in the, the wars of the uh, 1840s, the uh, British Sino Wars, of the 1840s. Um, but they never discussed opium in the debate, in the parliamentary debate in Britain. It wasn't in the declaration for war and it wasn't in the treaties that they signed with Beijing. Um, it appears to be the case that the British were actually more concerned with Beijing treating them as an equal power and for them to stop interning their citizens and treating them like a subordinate power, wouldn't let them dock their ships when they were there engaged in good faith, good faith, uh, commerce and Christian missionaryism. Um, so, uh, I think that perhaps, the fact that we're being flooded with opioids right now might have something to do with this Chinese propaganda narrative that they probably believe themselves um, the, uh, that the British uh, forced opium upon. Of course, it was legal everywhere in the world at the time. And uh, there, there have been opium dens in China since time immemorial. Um, and, uh, you know, we have the, uh, the commission that's ongoing right now. Here is Sam Cooper, who has not been asked to testify at uh, the commission on, uh, on Chinese interference or foreign interference. Um, and uh, Sam Cooper was the, the uh, journalist who uh, published the leaks from the, uh, the CSIS leaker. And then, um, you know, the globalist news was sued and you have um, uh, Wan Pao Wu, uh, the, the obvious, you know, uh, Chinese Communist Party asset who holds a seat in our Senate, um, having the uh, commemoration of the Chinese Exclusion Act on Canada Day last year, where they bust in all kinds of Chinese people to astroturf um, all this stuff about how racist Canada is. And that's another part of the PSYOP is they're always calling us racist anytime we want to, any, anytime we're going, hey, what's going on over there? What are you guys doing? They go, oh, that's very racist. I tell them into email that that's very racist. Um, yeah, that was uh, Vincent Kerr, by the way. He actually said that to Globalist News. Um, so uh, yeah, check out Sam Cooper over on Substack. Uh, his Substack is called The Bureau. Title here is Ottawa knew of the Chinese communist attacks on conservatives in 2021, but decided not to intervene, commission lawyer. FIC, um, so that's Foreign Interference Commission, 
Here's also that the Greater Vancouver, quote, pro-democracy, close quote, NDP candidate Jenny Kwan, targeted by the United Front Work Department group that supported her Liberal Party opponent in 2021. Uh, United Front Work Department is the Chinese Communist Party's proxy overseas. So um, they engage in a lot of um, the kind of influence operations and elite capture and stuff like that. Gangsterism broadly um, in order to further Chinese interests in countries like ours. Uh, here's the article. Before Canada's 2021 federal election, a task force implemented to ensure fair campaigning uh, observed a Chinese Communist Party operation discouraging Canadians from voting for the Conservative Party but intentionally chose not to intervene, the Foreign Interference Commission heard Wednesday. And in a secret post-election report, the task force confirmed, quote, the PRC sought to clandestinely and deceptively influence Canada's 2021 federal election, close quote, the inquiry heard. Meanwhile, the inquiry heard for the first time that Chinese communist proxies targeted greater Vancouver candidates, such as NDP MP Jenny Kwan in the 2019 federal election by gatekeeping them away from vote-rich Chinese community events, and that Ottawa also knew a United Front Work Department group evidently supported Kwan's liberal opponent in 2021 with an extravagant, quote, free lunch, close quote, event for voters, but failed to inform Kwan. Quote, in light of a media report about uh, transfer of funds from the Chinese consulate in Toronto to campaigns, Kwan uh, wonders whether the Chinese consulate in Vancouver may be operating a petty cash slush fund to finance such events, close quote, Kwan's witness submission said. Two of the conservatives attacked in Beijing funded media schemes in 2021 that reportedly originated in Toronto, former Van Vancouver area MP Jenny Ch uh, Kenny Chu and Former party leader Aaron O'Toole told the commissioner, uh, Mary Jose Hogue, that uh, hearing evidence proves Canada's government failed to protect its last election and the Chinese diaspora heavily targeted by Beijing. Quote, I was deeply troubled that I was exposed to the government uh, and the government doesn't seem to care, close quote, Chu testified. Quote, and, how, uh, and now I have learned that they knew about it. Uh, they knew all about it. Uh, it is almost like I was drowning and they were watching, close quote. Chu said, as an immigrant to Canada, he feels especially betrayed by leaders in Ottawa that have demonstrated in action. Quote, in my view, the buck stops with the prime minister, close quote, Chu said. Quote, he, he let me down, close quote. Chu and O'Toole were shown a number of intelligence alerts produced in the weeks prior to the September 20th, 2021 vote by Canada's so-called uh, city task force or site uh, task force and rapid uh, response team units touted by the Trudeau government as world-class election safeguards. He keeps putting up all of these faux kind of uh, committees and stuff like ENSICOP that never used to exist, but everything, uh, it all has to do with like keeping it in-house, right? Like ENSICOP, that's why they were trying to get uh, uh, Pierre Polyev to uh, to uh, join Ensecop so he could be sworn to secrecy and he would be very restricted in discussing whatever came out of their investigations through Ensecop. So um, it has everything to do, I think, with um, kind of keeping it behind closed doors and keeping it in-house for the Trudeau regime uh, instead of being transparent about um, the uh, enormous challenge that we all currently face. Uh, okay, back to the article. O'Toole was asked by the commission lawyers if he got his alert published one week prior to the ballot saying, quote, Rapid Response Canada has observed what may be a Chinese Communist Party information operation that aims to discourage voters from voting for the Conservative Party of Canada, close quote. Uh, quote, no, uh, this was not raised to our attention. And in fact, we were raising incidents of foreign interference and the CITE committee uh, tended to downplay them, close quote. Uh, O'Toole said, quote, which is why these documents now contradict that, which is why these documents now contradict that. OK, close quote. Um, yeah. And uh, Blandrew Shear without the dimples, Aaron O'Toole was as milk toast as he has ever been on the stand in the clip that I showed from uh, the commission uh, just the other day here. Uh, you know, he, he should be spitting nails up there, but he's still towing that establishment line of, um, yes, they interfered, but no, it had no impact on the outcome of the election. Uh, the current regime is legitimate and not installed by the Chinese Communist Party, not at all. Um, whatever, uh, Blandrew's here without the nibbles. 
Grow a spine. <laughs> so, uh, okay, back to the article. Other pre-election reports from CIT and Rapid Response showed, quote, CCP media accounts on Chinese social media platforms, WeChat, and Doyen uh, shared widely a narrative that conservatives' election platform suggests Aaron O'Toole almost wants to break diplomatic ties with China. And the narrative has grown in scale, close quote, the inquiry heard. The Ottawa and Ottawa knew of other messages shared between Chinese state media, Chinese media in Canada, and Chinese controlled social media claiming, quote, Chinese Canadians are scared of the conservative platform, close quote. And Kenny Chu was an enemy of the Chinese people because Chu had tabled a bill advocating for foreign agent registration. Yeah, it's racist. It's very racist to have a foreign agent registry. That's why uh, Wan Pao Wu went down there with uh, the AstroTurfers to shame us all for there ever having been a Chinese Exclusion Act before anybody was, any of us were alive. Um, so uh, yeah, it's to call us all racist and tell us to stop looking into all this Chinese interference because that's very racist. Um, quote, WeChat News accounts in Canada continue to post false, a false claim that uh, Kenny Chu sponsored private members bill would require, quote, all individuals or groups with ties to China to be required to register, close quote. One uh, CITI report said. Another narrative recognized by CITI prior to the election was that O'Toole was supposedly a follower of Donald Trump and would be harmful to China if elected prime minister. And who is the most racist of them all? Mirror, mirror on the wall? Well, it's Donald J. Trump, right? Anybody who represents an impediment to the Chinese Communist Party's agenda of global dominance, they just call him a racist. And the most racist guy in the world is Donald J. Trump. However, there was a meeting on September 9th, 2021. A lawyer for conservative MP Michael Chong informed the hearing in which CITI decided not to intervene because they judged the nationwide election result would not be swayed. A September 13th internal brief from the CITI presented to the hearing seems to confirm that contradictory position. Quote, Canada's electoral system and processes continue to remain resilient to the current level of foreign interference, close quote, the alert said. You know what my favorite question is, right, guys? It's how do you know that? How do you know that the elections are made resilient and the... Um, the interference um, did not sway the outcome. But it also said, quote, the PRC continues to be focused on influencing and potentially interfering with Canadian democratic processes, having identified Canadian politicians considered anti-PRC, sanctioned by a sitting MP, uh, redacted sentences follow, close quote. O'Toole testified the Conservatives believe they lost up to nine seats in 2021 as a direct result of Chinese interference and CITI should have intervened prior to the vote. Yeah, you don't say nine seats. Like, that's not nothing. That is significant, especially when we have the um, the the uh, smallest minority government that we've ever had in Canadian history. You think those uh, extra nine seats would have made a difference? Um, I tend to think so, yeah. I, I'm not sure exactly what the, the seat count is right off the top of my head, but um, man, well, like what would that coalition um, look like if, uh, if the Conservatives had another nine seats right now? Quote, to suggest an election is free and fair is not accurate. If some people are impacted, even votes, uh, each vote matters, close quote, O'Toole said. Uh, quote, it was a mistake not to raise the alarm, close quote. Yeah, now he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. So um, pretty typical for Blanders here without the nipples. Trudeau fed Beijing's disinformation narratives inquiry hears. Both O'Toole and Chu testified they believe Prime Minister Trudeau fed into the Chinese disinformation attacks that marred the 2021 election by pushing back on preceding conservative questions about security breaches in the Winnipeg lab. I mean, he called the election because of the Winnipeg lab. It was in order to shut down the committee that was looking into it because after an election, you have new MPs and you have to reform the committee and start it all from scratch. And of course, we just got that massive uh, report that's redacted, but um, still very damning. Um, we finally just got it. So things are moving forward, but they've been stalled by a few years, it seems. Quote, I believe there is some coincidence between the prime minister saying, don't be anti-Asian if you inquire what happened in the Wuhan lab in Winnipeg, close quote, Chu said. Uh, quote, I don't know if the Chinese copied that attack or the liberals copied China, but the anti-Asian line has been used continuously by the Chinese Communist Party against me, close quote. <laughs> Can you Chu? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I think people are wising up to this, finally. Chu noted that a document table by the commission lawyers showed him for the first time that the Chinese disinformation against him during the 2021 campaign started with the media accounts in Toronto. The federal documents tied the accounts to Beijing's United Front Work Department, the inquiry heard. Articles from Toronto attacking Chu included an account called Quote, uh, Coupon King 51CA, close quote, the documents tabled say and question whether this account is tied to a larger Chinese news site and WeChat account called 51.ca. 
A 2016 report from the Globe and Mail, not discussed at the inquiry, suggests 51.ca has historically supported the Ontario Liberal politician and Ontario Liberal politician. Uh, yeah, it's always liberal, isn't it? Well, I suppose NDP to an extent too, but it's going to be the left um, because communism is a leftist ideology and they tend to find more ideological overlap with parties that are on the left. Um, and parties on the left tend to be more sympathetic to them. Uh, because for progressives, uh, the, the progress in uh, progressivism is progress toward communism. Um, a, a 2016 report from the Globe and Mail, not discussed in the inquiry, suggests 51.ca has historically supported an Ontario liberal politician. O'Toole said he believed Beijing favored the liberals and attacked the conservatives in 2021 because O'Toole's party had taken stronger positions on the national security issues more aligned with the United States and Western allies. Yeah, the United States has a Foreign Agent Registry Act. Uh, I don't think that's what it's called, but they definitely have one. Um, and, you know, I don't think that uh, I, I, that uh, Australia is quite as naive when it comes to the threat coming from communist China as um, as Canadians are right now. OK, uh, quote, we had taken strong positions with regards to the Uyghurs and the two Michaels, close quote, O'Toole said, quote, if I had won, we would have been much more wide eyed uh, view with China. So that drove the interest with Beijing and the liberal government was preferable. Um, the commission also heard that O'Toole might have lost votes to Russian disinformation in 2021. Quote, Chinese and, Can or, sorry, Chinese and China state-aligned accounts continue to amplify messages by or supportive of the Liberal Party of Canada, while Russian-friendly accounts continue to amplify People's Party of Canada-related content. Close quote. One election monitoring document sent. Really? Okay, that's interesting. Um, in later testimony, a Vancouver area NDP MP uh, Jenny Kwan testified that she believed Chinese proxies may have been involved in, quote, vote buying, close quote, or, quote, unquote, bribes that supported her liberal opponent with a free lunch event in the 2021 election. I'm pretty sure that violates some election laws right there. A commission lawyer disclosed to Kwan um, that uh, Saiti, quote, flagged this issue with uh, with the lunch, close quote, and connected it to a United Front Work Department group in Vancouver, and yet Kwan was never informed by Saiti. Kwan told the hearing she was heartbroken that some Chinese senators in Vancouver informed her they were afraid uh, to cast votes for her because... Uh, sorry, Chinese seniors, I said senators. Uh, they're afraid to cast votes for her because she openly demonstrated on Chinese human rights issues. Quote, some told me they were afraid for me, close quote, Kwan said. Quote, they said you should be careful. Um, yeah, that's uh, always a bad sign. So even our own politicians uh, being, you know, intimidated, steered, muzzled, um, influenced by the Chinese Communist Party to uh, align with China's interests. And uh, who knows if we're ever going to get to the bottom of it. But um, I think, uh, well, only time will tell with respect to this inquiry. We, we need uh, stronger people in there than uh, Blandrew Shear without the dimples, though. That is for sure. We need fighters. And here is Andy Lee, special rebel rapporteur. And she's saying Chinese video, uh, sorry, Chinese Radio Vancouver works with diplomats and runs their WeChat account out of China. So, no, they wouldn't host Kenny Chu. And she's retweeting herself here because uh, here is the original video. And she says, uh, Senator O oh gets the rock star treatment at Chinese Radio Vancouver. The quote unquote Canadian media outlet meets with Chinese diplomats and accompanied him to a recent protest in Ottawa against a foreign agent registry. It's posted on their WeChat, which has an IP address in Liaoning, uh, China. Yeah. So uh, again, Victor O oh and Wan Pao Wu, the guys who were uh, doing the astroturfing for um, the Chinese Exclusion Act protest on Canada Day. Uh, which was 100 years ago. But anyway, here is Victor O oh showing up at this Vancouver radio station. Dale, you're late. Drop and give me 20. This is a Vancouver radio station. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we're not really, um, you know, joking when we say we better start learning Mandarin. Holy smokes. 
Um, so here is an interesting little tidbit. This is an article uh, originally published in 2015, updated in 2017. This is Langley Advanced Times. Title is New Owner for Alder Grove Zoo. So this is the Greater Vancouver Zoo. Name of individual who purchased the facility was not revealed in an official announcement. Oh, really? Uh, the Greater Vancouver Zoo has a new owner who has big plans for the 120-acre Alder Grove site. The zoo announced the sale in a press release Monday that did not identify the buyer. Huh. It said the new owner is originally from China, but has been living in Metro Vancouver for the last 10 years. Oh, whew. okay. There's nothing to be concerned about there. Quote, many years ago, he began his career as an English teacher, but for several years now, he has been a successful entrepreneur with a passion for creating interesting and exciting places for people to have fun. Close quote. The statement said the anonymous owner has hired an expert in eco-friendly zoo design, Bernard Harrison and friends to develop a 20 year master plan for the whole facility. The zoo said Harrison and two other exhibit specialists from the U S visited the great Greater Vancouver Zoo this summer. The Greater Vancouver Zoo was called the Vancouver Game Farm when it first opened in 1970. Okay, all great. So we have an anonymous buyer. This is from 2015 of the Greater Van Vancouver Toronto Zoo. And he's from China. But don't worry, guys. He's already been in Canada for 10 years. Um, and you remember what we saw from the Fox News clip there just a minute ago, where Christy Nome was telling us how China's buying up all of these properties in, um, in uh, certain locations where they may be able to spy on U.S. defense facilities. So here is uh, this uh, Chinese uh, entrepreneur, sounds like United Front Works Department to me, uh, buying the uh, the the Greater Toronto or sorry Greater Vancouver Zoo and that is located in Alder Grove. So here is a shot from um, uh, Maps. Anyway, this isn't Google Maps. It doesn't show it as well on Google Maps, but um, this is uh, from that browser that I use, Brave. And um, here we can see the Greater Vancouver Zoo. It's right here in. Uh, this uh, this street right here, it looks like it's this this larger area right here around 52nd Avenue between that and whatever that street is. It's right off the Trans-Canada Highway. So it says Greater Vancouver, the Vancouver Zoo. That's right there. And what do we have right across the street here in this massive open area? Well, Naval Radio Section Alder Grove. Yeah, that's right. I, I remember this because we actually have... Uh, well, I, I used to manage the microwave portfolio for all of uh, Department of National Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, and I had like several repeaters out there um, at this particular site. And there's all kinds of stuff. There's HF. This is the like ground radio station for naval communications on the Pacific Coast. It's right there in Alder Grove, right across the street from a Chinese owned zoo. Um, and you know what else is here that they're not going to show you on this map? It's just further to the south and west. It's a harp facility. Yeah, it's it's the 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 Americans their harp facility facility the uh, high altitude or whatever it is. And it's you know skipping skipping radio waves off the ionosphere. Um, and everybody thinks it's for creating earthquakes, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to say it's the Americans. Um, it's it's a it's an antenna farm, okay, for for radio communications for the Americans. And if I just zoom out here a little bit, holy smokes, that sure is close to the American border now, isn't it? Okay, pretty good, uh, pretty close proximity to the uh, American border. We've got the Americans Harp Station right here that is basically co-located. Co with uh, the Royal Canadian Navy's Naval Radio Section in Alder Grove. And look at that, Greater, Van uh, Greater Vancouver Zoo right across the street. So, um, yeah, I mean, when I say they got our, their tentacles into everything, like, I mean it. Like, this is how they operate. It's full-spectrum warfare, right? Like, um, it's the flooding us with the fentanyl. It's the investment. It's the influence. It's the owning the radio stations, um, getting people into our Senate uh, buying a property that is uh, adjacent to military communications facilities. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> we uh, we definitely need to extricate ourselves from the Chinese Communist Party at this point. Nothing short of that is going to do. Um, and uh, what is our military doing? Well, this isn't really our military. This is um, Veterans Affairs. But um, I think I showed a little bit of this here the other day. Here is the official press release from the government of Canada. Government of Canada to lead a delegation of two SLGBTQI plus veterans to commemorate the First World War in Europe. Well, 
That ought to protect those naval assets from the Chinese Communist Party that are setting up shop right across the street. Uh, okay, I'll read a little bit of this. Yeah, it's not that long. I guess I can stand it. Media Advisory, Ottawa, Ontario. The Government of Canada is leading an overseas commemorative program for 2S LGBTQI plus ampersand asterisk Octothorpe veterans to commemorate the First World War as we approach the 107th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Starting April 6th in Belgium, the delegation composed of representatives from Rainbow Veterans of Canada and the LGBT Purge, the first veteran delegation of its kind, will follow in the footsteps of... Uh, Frederick Hardy, who was sentenced to hard labor in 1916 for charges relating to his sexuality and later died in battle across the battlefields of Europe. Um, this important historical moment for veterans from the 2S LGBTQI plus ampersand asterisk um, divided by sign community will com c uh, culminate in uh, April 9th, where they will see uh, Frederick Hardy's name on the Canadian National Vimy Ridge Memorial and participate in the annual ceremony. The delegation's program in Belgium will include visits to key commemorative sites, including the Passchendaele Canadian Memorial, St. Julian Canadian Memorial, and the John McRae Memorial. They will also attend the daily act of remembrance at the Menin Gate Memorial. Once in France, the delegation... Okay, it's just their itinerary. I don't think I need to read the whole damn thing here. But, um, uh, yeah. So, do uh, you think maybe um, we might want to get back to basics at some point and uh, everybody just kind of focus on their jobs instead of all of this uh, commie BS and uh, psychological operations, uh, Maoist takeover of the West, all of the shaming and blaming? I mean, that's what uh, that's what Trudeau really is at the end of the day, I think, is a Maoist. You know, it's got everything to do with this uh, shame and hostility toward the outsider and praise for the insider. For Mao, it was, you know, there are the people and then there's the enemy of the people. And when it comes to uh, uh, Sock Boy and the alphabet cult, <laughs> as Cindy is calling them, um, when it comes to Sock Boy, it's Canadian, as in Canadian snow, um, whenever he's, uh, you know, pushing his his line. Canadian snow. And then uh, the outsiders are the, um, the, uh, uh, what do you call them? The unacceptables, right? So uh, we're racist, bigot, homophobic, um, sexist, all that stuff. The the unacceptables, and everybody inside it, in the in group is Canadian. Okay, and here's the Epoch Times. Information Commissioner sues Defense Minister over failure to release records on COVID policies. Well, you know, at least they're um, they're honest, professional, integral, all of that uh, stuff that every uh, professional Western military should be. Um, so yeah, we have a, we have a problem with, uh, integrity, uh, honor and, uh, professionalism at the highest levels of the Canadian armed forces. As you can see, uh, they're being sued by another government office, the information commissioner, uh, subtitle is the commissioner's office is seeking a court order to force the department or sorry, the defense department to comply with its request and respect the access to information act. Um, Canada's information commissioner has filed a lawsuit in federal court to force the Department of National Defense, DND, to provide records on its COVID-19 policies as requested through an access to information request. Quote, the minister's ongoing violation of his legal duty to implement the commissioner's binding order issued under the act is contrary to the law, close quote, says the notice of application filed on December 18th. It adds uh, that the lack of responsiveness is in is an, quote, abuse of process, close quote, um, undermining the credibility of the access to information system. Information Commissioner Carolyn Maynard has previously sharply criticized the access to information system, saying its, quote, steady decline, close quote, has led to a point where it, quote, no longer serves its intended purpose, close quote. Defense Minister Bill Blair is identified as the respondent in the lawsuit. The Office of the Information Commissioner, OIC, is seeking a court order to compel DND to comply with its order and respect the access to information Act. And don't forget that Bill Blair was the guy, while well, Minister of Public Safety, who told uh, Brenda Lucky to go back into that RCMP meeting with her investigators during the Porta Peak massacre and tell them to break with their protocol uh, and, uh, and uh, compromise the integrity of the investigation by releasing the types of firearms used in the massacre so the liberals could um, per could uh, pursue their gun confiscation agenda. So yeah, this guy uh, speaking of a lack of integrity, there's Minister Bill Blair. He just does whatever the hell serves his masters. 
The notice of application states that DND received a request for records on June 15th, 2022, asking for, quote, options, analysis, assessments, and recommendations, close quote, pertaining to the Canadian Armed Forces, CAF, quote, COVID-19 vaccination mandate and public health measures, including but not limited to masking, quarantine, physical distancing, air quality assessments, infrastructure assessments, close quote. The access to information request sought related information produced by or submitted to five DND offices from January 2019 to June 2022. COVID-19 restrictions in the CAF have been controversial, particularly the COVID-19 vaccination mandate imposed in October 2021, which led to the departure or expulsion of hundreds of soldiers. It remained in place to this day for operational roles. Uh, and they are being sued, um, you know, by our most uh, courageous members. They're a tip of the spear in the military. Everybody who refused the vax and is now part of the uh, mass tort. I don't want to say class action. I think it's a mass tort that um, Valor Legal Action Center has underway under the helmsmanship of friend of the program, Catherine Christensen. So, um, yeah, that I think I like... <laughs> That, that is, um, they are leading the way. That is the tip of the spear right there. Uh, them and Eddie Cornell, of course, with um, with his uh, lawsuit now over the Emergency Measures Act invocation. Um, okay, and back to the article here. The OIC says DND initially requested a 90-day extension to respond, citing a large number of records, but it didn't meet its own deadline. The requester hence filed a complaint with the OIC. I don't buy that. Like the, the, the large number of records for um, the the military's policy on on COVID, that shouldn't be, that should be like one document, you know, maybe uh, 10 pages um, and, and in the form of an op order. So um, that, uh, if you don't know what an op order is, well, <laughs> um, the first, you know, three pages are addressees. Um, okay. So uh, the commissioner found the uh, complaint was justified on June 12, 2023, and deemed DND had refused access to the records. An order was issued for DND to comply with the request by November 30, 2023. The legal filing says the DND told the OIC it would comply with the order, but it still did not meet the November deadline. A DND spokesperson declined to comment given uh, the issue is headed to court. An OIC spokesperson also declined to comment for the same reason, but added that, quote, institutions not implementing her orders is a concern. Uh, for the commissioner. Yeah, I'll say. The OIC spokesperson noted that departments are required to comply with the orders to release documents unless they apply to the federal court for a review. The OIC rarely resorts to legal action to force government departments to respond to access to information requests. It's the second time Ms. Maynard has taken legal action since the start of her tenure in 2018. Last year, the OIC took the Trans Mountain Corporation to court to force the release of records. The judge sided with the OIC in, uh, uh, in a September September 2023 decision, COVID scrutiny. DND and the CAF are facing other legal actions with regard to their management of COVID-19. Active and recently released soldiers have filed two separate lawsuits against the CAF's leadership, alleging abuse of power and violation of charter rights in relation to COVID-19 policies. The list of alleged infractions includes, quote, ignoring established law, close quote, on the right to privacy, informed consent, and the right to choose medical treatment. That has always been an issue in my entire career. Not like before COVID-19, there's no respect for the Privacy Act whatsoever. Like people just, I, one of my, my, um, last immediate supervisors went digging into my medical stuff that was never supposed to leave the desk of the commanding officer for crying out loud. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they, they seem to think that uh, they own you. They really do. They, they don't, I, I don't, if you, if you started talking about the human rights of the troops, like they would scoff at that um, military leadership. Okay, uh, back to the article. In a statement of defense for one of the lawsuits, the attorney general has called the legal action, quote, scandalous, frivolous, and vexatious, close quote. Yeah, okay. Um, the legal challenges include a total of 458 individuals, one of which is the originator of the information request being litigated by the information commissioner. Attorney uh, Catherine Christensen, who represents the soldiers, says uh, the OIC's legal recourse against the defense minister is, quote, long overdue, but welcome. Quote, DND CAF has a long history of blocking the release of documents necessary for litigation, including on the two mass torts now before the court. It has, uh, it has to be asked what they want to hide close quote she told the epoch times in a statement everything they hide everything absolutely everything don't forget um you know it, it was the general they were doing uh, they had a captain who testified at mark norman's uh trial there who said that when he was running the uh the search the information search he went to the general and he was like i can't find anything related to admiral norman here and he was and the general was like it's not our first rodeo as in it's not our first cover-up and really all he had to do was tell him that his code name um his call sign 
was uh, Kraken, by the way. That was, uh, I don't think that's classified anymore, so I can probably talk about that. But uh, yeah, he's retired now. So um, that was Admiral Norman's call sign. And using call signs for VAPs is common practice in uh, in a military setting. It just adds a layer of security, even when you're using unclassified communication media. Um, okay, uh, along with uh, not releasing records requested to the Access to Information Act, Chief of Defense Staff uh, General Wayne Iyer has yet to address several agencies ruled on the Military Grievance External Review Committee last year, the MGERC. MGERC, a non-binding administrative tribunal, found that the CAF's vaccine mandate was, quote, not in accordance with the principle of fundamental justice, close quote, and breaches the Grievers' Charter rights. Yes, that is correct. Um, and that's why I say that that's the tip of the spear. That was really the first decision that we had, um, favorable, that is, with respect to vaccine mandates, was out of the Military Grievance External Review Committee. So... Uh, da, da, da. And, uh, oh, here is, um, speaking of no respect for privacy, um, as the regulars will know, like I'm always talking about the fourth turning and how the boomers must be stopped. And the reason that the Canadian Armed Forces has been in a state of total collapse for 30 years is because that is the institution in which the boomer generation reaches peak institutional power first due to the lower retirement age and the higher rate of attrition. But they have seeped into the other institutions now. That would include the Legion, which is disgraced. Um, you know, they uh, defamed James Topp. Uh, they refused me service for not taking the jab. They refused a ton of us um, service for not. That's when I started wearing the hat. This this hat right here. It says, lest we forget. And I've got the, the last, the last crossed out because we forget. I mean, we forget that uh, people died for these freedoms. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the legion of all institutions um, should have been leading the way, uh, showing, showing some courage in all of this. And they're spineless um, and, and sniveling and, um, corrupt just like the military is right now uh, because of this overlap this kind of generational overlap um so here is uh here's an article from ctv news saskatchewan title is afghanistan veteran pushes ahead with lawsuit against saskatchewan legion and veterans affairs okay so uh, a saskatchewan veteran says he's still pursuing his lawsuit against the royal canadian legion after he discovered a legion staff member was snooping into his and other veterans records internal veterans affairs canada vac emails shared with ctv news last year outlined a months-long investigation into breaches of the personal medical and other information of up to six veterans by one service officer at the regina branch of the legion i bet you that's a boomer i'm just i'm just going to plant a flag on that i could be wrong but um yeah i mean i'll, I'll bet you five dollars um, the veteran who shared the information with CTV News filed a statement of claim against VAC and the Saskatchewan Legion last May, seeking damages in excess of $500,000. In the lawsuit, the veteran is known only as CD. The privacy breaches stem from an agreement between the Legion and VAC that allows Legion service officers to access veterans', veterans uh, personnel, financial, and medical records in a federal government database in order to help them apply for benefits. They are required to have signed permission to represent a veteran uh, before accessing files. Yeah, no kidding. Um, yeah, just, just scandalous. Um, in its defense, Veterans Affairs says it moved swiftly once it discovered there were several privacy breaches from the region, or sorry, from the Regina Legion branch. Quote, VAC was made aware of the allegations that Paul Velacque um, improperly accessed uh, veteran records in 2021-22. I recognize that, rain, that name somehow. Um, the Veterans Affairs lawyer says in a statement of defense filed in October. Quote, VAC security uh, promptly investigated the allegations and concluded that Paul Valacque had uh, improperly accessed the plaintiff's CSDN file without a proper justification. Paul Valacque's access to the CSDN has been revoked and his reliability level security status is in the process of being revoked, close quote. Uh, if, if you don't even have reliability status, like, <laughs> uh, good luck getting a, a job with government of Canada. Okay. Um, in the internal emails of, well, I, I don't really know that. I'm sure you can get stuff without your reliability status, but, um, that's, that's pretty bad when you, when your reliability status is revoked, this isn't like, you know, fricking, uh, top secret, uh, special access or anything like that. Um, in the internal emails, the veterans shared with CV News, one VAC staff member said they found Velacque demonstrated, quote, a lot of carelessness when accessing files, close quote, on the database. Two Regina veterans were sent letters saying their private information was accessed, quote, where there was no work-related requirement to do so, close quote. Well, that's gross and nosy and creepy. 
Quote, we have discussed this in the past about how the RCL service officers seem to be overreaching for their scope of work for VAC clients, close quote, a staffer writes in an email from September 2022. And that sounds um, just terribly familiar. I mean, we have this problem all over the CAF where uh, the boomers, our supervisors, feel like they have every right to um, all information about us. Uh, including all of the private medical stuff that they're not supposed to see. There's a reason why we, we keep medical information private in Canada. It's so we don't face discrimination, right? Um, so, um, it, but uh, they don't have any respect for anybody. So, um, to, 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 in the September 2022 investigation into the Regina Legion, VAC questioned the Legion Veteran Services Director Carolyn Hughes about why Valakwe needed to access certain files. She responded that in many cases he, quote, could not recall why he would have accessed them in the past, close quote. Hughes also said previous staff at the Legion branch weren't tracking their access at all. Quote, unfortunately, for the last several months he was working there, he uh, and also the previous officers were not keeping any form of tracking whatsoever, close quote. That was, that's the story of my career. It's like every time I get to like the next level, you go from like, you know, the tactical to the operational, to the strategic, everywhere I went, it was just like, there's no tracking, there's no systems, there's, there's no, um, Nothing like what, what the hell has everybody been doing for the last 30 years? Uh, you, you got to build everything from scratch. Okay. A security officer at Veterans Affairs noted Blackway uh, included minimal detail when filling out the online forms requested for access. Following his investigation, the federal department changed the rules to require slightly more detail from the Legion service officers when accessing the database. When contacted by CTV News last year, the director of the Legion's Saskatchewan command, Chad Wagner, said he had only received direct information about one privacy breach from VAC. He declined to comment as it was still before the courts, and he did say that veterans were free to withdraw their consent from the Legion service officers at any time. Everyone should do that, like right now, and get with um, one of the many uh, way better organizations that are out there helping veterans right now. Um, veterans for Healing in my hometown here. Um, the veteran farmer. I hear lots of great stuff about them. If you need help with your back stuff, then, then go to one of these other uh, groups and stay the hell away from the creepy legion. Um, <clears throat> Uh, da, da, da. In a statement of defense filed in August, the Saskatchewan Legion uh, took issue with CD's choice to launch a lawsuit anonymously saying it was, quote, impossible for the defendants to uh, present the file uh, a response. Uh, present and file a responsive defense, not knowing the identity of the plaintiff, close quote. The Legion also argues CD's anonymity violates the rules of court. The Legion says his claim is improper, quote, a nullity, close quote, and should be dismissed. Yeah, um, of course, they're not going to try to make him whole. Um, despite calling for a significant financial compensation from the Legion and Veterans Affairs, CD says he was... Um, so it's what he really wants was to see a change to the agreement between the federal government and the Legion to prevent this kind of unregulated access to private information of veterans, many of whom now suffer disability as a result of their service. Quote, I think ultimately if VAC just wants to, uh, was to see just how badly they've gone through that system and run amok with it, they'd just take it away. I would like both of the individuals from the Legion to lose their jobs. Good. Uh, they should not be working in that space with, with a vulnerable population, close quote. He told CTV News in March. Yeah, a lot of people who are working with veterans should not be working with that vulnerable population. Um, we're we're freaking cash cows, man. I'm having to go through this March of Dimes now. I'm not having a good experience like dealing with these outside providers and stuff like that. It's just, uh, it all goes to the lowest bidder and um, we're something like the livestock in the system. Okay. Quote, unfortunately, I don't have control over that kind of stuff. So that's why we ended up asking for money, which is silly because it was never about the money, close quote. Um, yeah, okay. So I'm glad that somebody's out there holding these guys' feet to the fire and hopefully these, uh, these uh, Legion officers get fired at the, uh, at the very least. Okay. And um, yeah, okay. And here is what's going on with uh, the, the senior leadership of the Canadian Armed Forces here. Um, this is the Ottawa Sun. It says, after facing criticism for woke agenda, General Wayne Ayer's X account no longer allows comments. Well, that's very courageous of you, General. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we saw here previously, I was reporting on it when he was blocking multiple veterans for calling him out on his commie BS. Uh, Jeremy McKenzie, Alex Cabana, um, and uh, a few others. Um, but uh, okay, so here is uh, this spineless, sniveling, throne sniffing bureaucrat. 
and uh, masquerading as a professional officer. And um, uh, subtitle is, we observed a, a concerning increase in malicious and misinformative engagements that proved detrimental to the Canadian Armed Forces, ethics, values, and communication objectives, close quote, said a DNP spokesperson. Oh, oh, are you snowflakes melting? Oh, no. Uh, public comments on the official social media account of Canada's top soldier have been blocked by the military because of the nasty remarks being made about the general as well as the government policies. Uh, yeah, that's, maybe it's not everyone else, woke waner. <laughs> maybe the problem is you and your frickin' commie policies. Um, the move was made in January after the Chief of Defense Staff, General Wayne Iyer, uh, faced an increase in negative comments about his alleged poor leadership and his decision to bring in what some describe as the liberal government's quote-unquote woke agenda. Uh, defense insiders have told this newspaper that Iyer is extremely sensitive to the criticism he has faced. <laughs> uh, some of the controversial elements of his time as defense chief are the move to a gender neutral dress code and the decision to allow military personnel to have colored or long hair, face tattoos, or long nails if so desired. Like that is so. Iyer is extremely sensitive to the criticism he faces. For destroying Canada's military. That would be a more succinct way to say that. IR has faced additional criticism from the military personnel and the public for a variety of issues, including the lack of housing for troops, ongoing sexual assault in the ranks, and IR's decision to join the standing ovation in the House of Commons for a Waffen SS veteran. Yeah, it's not going well, is it, Woke Waiter? Um, <laughs> God. Yeah, they can't clothe us. They can't clothe the troops. They can't feed the troops. Um, and the ongoing sexual assault in the ranks, I don't think is a fair statement. It, um, it's really more like at, in the upper echelons now, because it's always been the boomer generation and they are the ones at the very top. And that's where, I mean, general Vance, you know, case in point, Iyer did not provide comment to questions, uh, submitted by this newspaper. National defense spokesperson, Andre and Poulain confirmed the decision to shut down the public comments on Iyer's official X account. Quote, in recent months, we observed a, con a concerning increase in malicious and misinformative engagements that proved detrimental to the Canadian Armed Forces, ethics, values, and communication objectives, close quote. Poulain noted in an email to this newspaper, quote, considering this, we made the decision back in January to close comments on the CDS chief of defense staff's X account, close quote okay uh, they're not interested in hearing any concerns from the public everybody if you're concerned uh about the sharp downturn in military professionalism over the last few years especially under the tenure of woke waner then that is uh malicious misinformation Poulin stated that, quote, this measure is aimed at, it's, it's criticism. Every, everything we talk about, everything they call misinformation is criticism. Poulin stated that, uh, quote, this measure is aimed at preserving a positive and respectful environment for everyone accessing our information. We believe it is crucial for a platform to uphold standards that promote constructive interactions and discourage harmful behaviors that counter the core principles of the Canadian Armed Forces. Oh, <laughs> were, you, were you harmed by uh, the words, Wayne? Oh God. Um, national defense would not answer whether there were any other, whether, uh, whether there were other official Canadian forces accounts that prohibit public comments or whether Iyer's account was the only one. It appears, however, that the only official Canadian Armed Forces account on X that does not allow comments is the one assigned to woke Wayner. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced they're so weak. These leftists are so weak. You see, like, this is another one of those things that's really encouraging that like the people that we're up against are weak inept cowards um and they're super dumb uh prime minister justin trudeau announced in january that ire would be retiring this summer ire has been defense chief uh, de uh defense chief since 2021 and in command of the military during one of the most tumultuous times which has included widespread allegations of sexual assault and misconduct among the senior ranks thank you that is a more fair statement Iyer was named acting to defense chief in February 2021 after it was revealed that military police were looking into misconduct allegations against then uh, Chief Admiral Art McDonald. Now, that one, I think, is dubious. It was probably more the case that Art McDonald was like, no vaccine mandate. That's a human rights violation. And we are the people who put our lives on the line to advance the cause of human rights in countries that we don't care about for people we never met. Um, so this goes against everything that we stand for. And, uh, anybody who did that got slapped with a sexual misconduct allegation and, uh, were shoved aside so they could get their yes men woke Wayner in the seat and force that gene therapy experiment on all the greatest Canadians alive. 
The Liberal government named Iyer as the full-time chief on November 25th of that year, even though no charges were laid against McDonald. But Iyer himself has an uh, has a controversial tenure. Um, in the fall of 2021, Iyer angered Canadian Forces personnel when he blamed the military sexual misconduct crisis on the COVID-19 pandemic for an exodus of personnel. Quote, we need our mid-level leaders to dig deep and do this for the institution, to put service before self, not to retreat into retirement, but to advance forward and face the challenges head on, close quote, Iyer stated then. Yeah, it's everybody else's fault. This is what they've been doing for decades, is they blame all the new people that are coming into the ranks, even know like it's been a scandal plague mess ever since uh they got there so the boomers that is um and scapegoat read read the book scapegoat uh cindy got that one for me uh i really appreciate i have some great uh, followers around here it really is more like a movement um but yeah scapegoat by um uh, Peter Worthington and Kyle Brown. Kyle Brown was the scapegoat for the Somalia affair. He was actually the whistleblower, and that is what the boomers do: is they uh, they go after whistleblowers like Julian Assange instead of um, seeking accountability. Now, when when they were the whistleblowers, um, like say um, you know uh, Deep Throat and who's the uh, who's the Bob Woodward? Bob Woodward was the uh, the boomer. Um, uh, uh, journalist at the time who broke the Watergate scandal. And, you know, at that time you, you could go to the institutions and they would, um, they would, uh, root out the corruption, but now that corruption is all the way at the top. And so we can't expect accountability. Uh, okay. Retired and serving military personnel said Iyer was out of touch and that the exodus of personnel had started long before the pandemic or the sexual misconduct crisis. Poor leadership and concerns about quality of life were among the issues cited by those who had left. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, that's the boomers. Poor leadership. It's been that way for decades. And he, uh, when he says, you know, we need our mid-level leaders to dig deep, like we're not being tough enough here or something like that, do this for the institution. He needs his career. When he says service before self, he says he's, he really means me, my image, my career. Um, that's, uh, that's service to him. We all need to put his career before ourselves. Um, and uh, it's just despicable. Like he's, he's basically shaming all the veterans here, like we're being unprofessional and cowardly here um, for not, um, you know, bending to his every whim to advance his career. Uh, okay. Other criti uh, others criticized Iyer for admonishing soldiers who had committed a large part of their lives to serving in the military, noting that they, they had the right to decide when they should leave. Iyer later acknowledged his comments, quote, it did not sit well with some current and former members, close quote. That's because they're atrocious. Okay. It's not because like, this, this is the guy who can't even leave the comments open on his ex. And he's basically implying with this statement that we're all being too sensitive, right? Did not sit well with some of the current and former members. Yeah. Well, you know, the comments on my ex are open there, Woke Wainer. Iyer also uh, faced criticism for promoting several senior officers who would later be engulfed in allegations of sexual assault or misconduct. He talked about the need for a cultural a culture change to stem the number of sexual assaults. Uh, but during his tenure, the number of reported incidents of sexual misconduct, uh, sexual misconduct and assaults has increased. Now, that is also due to the fact that they have expanded definitions. So, you know, it used to be like when the boomers would come up that sexual assault was sexual assault. Um, you know, and that everybody understood what that means. But when it comes to sexual misconduct, that could include things like, um, you know, um, uh, requests for dates from unattractive people. Um, just, just go and read the literature on that stuff. Okay. So uh, uh, last year, Trudeau, Iyer, and other senior government and military officials faced a lawsuit from Major General Danny Fortan for their alleged roles in Fortan's removal from command and a military police investigation into allegations of sexual assault. Fortan was ultimately acquitted of the charge. He settled his lawsuit out of court last year, and that probably had everything to do with the fact that uh, Fortan was not going to go along with the vaccine mandate as well. Okay, um, now, yeah, this is some very somber news coming out of Gaza. I reported here, I think it was yesterday, on there was um, uh, there was a strike on um, Al-Shifa Hospital, which has been an HQ for 
Hamas for, you know, basically like uh, the last couple of decades, probably. And um, this was the one, the Al Shiva hospital was the one that uh, Hamas had reported had been leveled by an Israeli airstrike when it turned out that it was just a failed rocket fired by Hamas on the Gaza side and hit the parking lot next to Al Shifa. And they said there were all these casualties. It was all, uh, um, you know, a big lie. And the New York Times reprinted Hamas propaganda verbatim. But um, now uh, it seems that we we do have a real uh, tragedy, a real friendly fire incident there where these aid workers, uh, the World's Kitchen, I think it's called, were killed. And as it turns out, one among them was a military veteran um, and uh, a Canadian military veteran. And this just goes to show you that, uh, you know, all the greatest people serve. Um, and this guy is, uh, this is clearly somebody who has dedicated a lifetime to serving his fellow humans um, and showing a lot of courage in, in going into war-torn Gaza Strip to uh, provide such aid. Um, but uh, fog of war, I guess, is um, is uh, all I can say here. It's, it's tragic, but um, a Canadian was among one of those killed. A Canadian killed Monday, along with six other aid workers in the Gaza Strip, was on a military was a military veteran from Quebec whose death leaves behind a partner and a one-year-old son. Jacob Flick, Flickinger, um, 33, joined the World Central Kitchen aid organization last fall at the at the urging of his good friend Jonathan Duguay. Uh, Flickinger had been helping the group in Gaza since early March. "Quote: Jacob was a fantastic guy." Close quote. Uh, Duguay said in an interview. The two met in 2010 when they were serving together in Afghanistan. He added, "Quote: He has all uh, he was always supportive, always smiling." Close quote. Duguay himself joined the World Central Kitchen in September, helping with food aid to Morocco following the devastating earthquake near Marrakesh. In November, he convinced Flickinger to come on board. Their first aid mission was in Mexico, providing food after Hurricane Otis slammed into the Acapelago, uh, or slammed into uh, Acapulco area as a Category 5 storm. Uh, we were both diagnosed with PTSD after Afghanistan, close quote. Duguay said, quote, this aid work changed my life, changed our lives. We used our military skills to bring solutions in chaos, close quote. Uh, sounds like satisfying work. Uh, they traveled to the Middle East in early March as World Central Kitchen was planning major expansions, including ambitious plans to deliver first aid to Gaza by sea in more than two decades. With uh, Israel enforcing strict rules on aid coming in by truck, World Central Kitchen devised a plan to build a makeshift jetty on the northern Gaza coast. They used the rubble of destroyed buildings to build up a small pier uh, from which pallets of food could be unloaded by a small crane from boats onto waiting trucks. The first shipment of about 200 tons of food was sent across on March 15th, carrying cans of vegetables, proteins, bags of rice, and legumes. Um, his second left Cyprus on Saturday with twice as much aid. Duguay was on the Cyprus side. Uh, Flicker, uh, sorry, Flickinger was um, was uh, part of the Gaza relief team. They spoke multiple times by phone or by text. Their last phone conversation on March 31st was just about normal things, discussing the shipment. Flickinger wasn't scared or apprehensive, said Duguay. Quote, he just wanted to help people, close quote. At 3 a.m. on April 2nd, Duguay was awakened by his phone ringing. It was another aid worker from Gaza calling to say an, quote, incident, close quote, at the warehouse in Deir al Balha, Bala in central Gaza had killed seven of their colleagues. Uh, quote, I knew Jacob was there, close quote, Duguay said. The convoy had just delivered food to the warehouse and was driving away when the Israeli airstrikes hit. Uh, an attack on the Israeli government has characterized the tragic mistake. Duguay, um, yeah, the, the Israeli government has characterized it as a tragic mistake. And I did show there was the IDF general there who did a, a public statement in, in the form of a video. Uh, I think I showed that here last night. And um, yeah, that was what he was saying as well. Like it was a, a tragic mistake. It was at night um, and it was a drone, uh, a drone attack. So um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, terrible. Um uh, Duguay said uh, the teams felt safe because the Israeli Defense Force was told of the plan. Israel had approved and provided security for the construction of the Jetty World Central Kitchen said, quote, we had an agreement with the IDF, close quote, said uh, Duguay. Um, quote, there was a special route. They knew we uh, they knew where we were, close quote. It was the way who delivered the tragic news by phone to Sandy Flickinger's partner, who was at home in Costa Rica with the couple's baby, uh, whose name the family has chosen to withhold. 
Flickinger and Sandy met almost five years ago at a cold water plunge in Quebec. Flickinger is a dual Canadian and American citizen. His father is American and lives in Miami. But Dubois said Flickinger grew up in St. George, Quebec, about 100 kilometers south of Quebec City. Quote, he fell in love immediately, close quote, said Dubois. Dubois was due to leave Cyprus on April 4th, and Flickinger was scheduled to leave not long after. Instead, Dubois flew to Montreal on Tuesday before he heads to Costa Rica to join Sandy and her father. The Canadian Armed Forces said Wednesday that Flickinger served from 2008 until 2019. He joined as a reserve infantry member with uh, Le Regiment de Chaudière uh, and was deployed to Afghanistan as a rifleman. He joined the regular force as infantry with Quebec's uh, storied uh, Royal 22nd Regiment. That's the Vandu, the storied Vandu, uh, known as the Vandu in 2012. He was a master corporal when he retired from the army in 2019. Flickinger's father, John, said in a Facebook post that his son's death was a, quote, heartbreaking tragedy, close quote. Quote, my son, Jacob, was killed Monday delivering food aid to serving families in Gaza, close quote. John Flickinger wrote, quote, he died doing what he loved and serving others uh, through his work with the World Central Kitchen, close quote. A GoFundMe page has been started to raise funds for a funeral and a trust fund for Flickinger's son. Nearly $30,000 um, had already been raised by Wednesday evening. Uh, also killed in Monday's airstrike were Lal Zawem, Lal, sorry, Lal Zawmi, uh, Zomi, um, Frank Com, 43, of Australia, who shared a video less than a week before she died, working at the warehouse uh, near where, um, says, uh, sorry, uh, near where the convoy was hit. It's saying warehouse, it keeps saying warehouse here. I was seeing all kinds of reports that it was actually at the Al Shifa hospital. So, um, yeah, a little bit of confusion there, I guess. Uh, Polish national Damien Sobal, 35, began volunteering for aid groups when his hometown of, uh, of uh, Perzimils uh, became a haven for refugees fleeing Russia's bombing in Ukraine. Palestinian Safedin Isim Ayed Abuta, uh, 25, was working for the charity as a driver. There were also three British military veterans killed, all providing security to the team, including John Chapman, 57, James Henderson, 33, and James Ker uh, Kirby, 47. Uh, de Guay said he knew both uh, Frank Com and Sobel as well. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said uh, has has called their deaths inadvertent, something that quote happens in war. Close quote. He said Canada is demanding more of an explanation. So are Poland, the United Kingdom, Australia, and the United States. Quote: The world needs very clear answers as to how this happened. Close quote. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said Wednesday. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie, who is in Belgium attending a NATO Foreign Ministers meeting, said she. She spoke to Israeli Foreign Minister uh, Israel Katz on Tuesday night. Quote, we're calling for a full investigation, close quote, she said. On social media, Katz ordered condolences to the families of victims as well as to their respective countries. The incident will be investigated by qualified authorities to ensure that necessary conclusions are drawn to guarantee the safety and security of aid workers going forward, close quote, he said. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's hope that we do get a full and uh, a full accounting of what happened and uh, lots of transparency on this one. Um, you know. We had the Tarnak farm incident early in Afghanistan as well, where uh, Major Harry Schmidt uh, killed four Canadians and wounded multiple others. And, you know, he was courts martialed and he ended up getting a, a not guilty um, verdict. Um, I talked to one of the guys that was there, too. I, I knew a guy who was wounded um, and uh, he seemed to think that it was it was a good judgment. I was like, I don't know how. I don't know how that could be because, uh, well, I guess maybe he knows the details that I don't. But uh, anyway, well, let's hope we get lots of detail on um, what happened here and uh, and, a, and a you know a good a good reporting on this. Okay, um, in an essay published Wednesday in the New York Times, the World Central Kitchen founder Jose Andreas play uh, played it with Israel to start the quote long journey to peace close quote quote we know Israelis Israelis in their heart of hearts we know that food is not a weapon of war close quote said Andreas a celebrity chef from Spain quote Israel is better than the way this war is being waged it is better than blocking food and medicine to civilians it is better than killing aid workers who have coordinated their movements with the Israeli defense forces close quote Andreas said the deaths of his seven colleagues are quote the direct result close quote of Israeli policy which quote squeezed humanitarian aid to to desperate levels, close quote. Uh, Duguay said his plans to help the family with funeral plans, but insisted the tragedy wouldn't keep him from returning to his job at the World Central Kitchen. This is uh, That's not what Jacob would have wanted, he said. Quote, we make a difference to people, close quote, said Duguay. Quote, we need to continue to feed people. Uh, that's my mission. It's what Jacob's main mission. Uh, he was a brother in arms. We were mates. I'm going to miss him, close quote. So um yeah the uh, compare and contrast here 
between woke wainer um and uh you know his experience with uh being too weak to handle the comments on x and then we have these uh younger generations of military veterans um just all the courage in the world and really going in there into uh the uh, most dangerous and difficult of situations to try to help people so um yeah i uh the uh the contrast is not lost on me here um just sounds like a real gem of a man um and uh well it is what it is i guess so here is reuters um so there's all kinds of there's all kinds of stuff of course going on over there in uh israel it's hard to tell if things are heating up or or cooling down quite frankly um many of the other of iran's other proxies have gotten uh active since the war to destroy hamas began um and uh, now we have uh, some action here from Damascus. This was uh, or, uh, in uh, in Syria. Um, here's Reuters, and they say Iran vows revenge on Israel after Damascus embassy attack. Uh, Dubai, Jerusalem, April 2nd, Reuters. Iran said on Tuesday it would take revenge on Israel for an airstrike that killed two of its generals and five military advisors, advisors at its embassy compound in Damascus, raising the risk of further escalation in conflict in the Middle East. The strike marked one of the most significant attacks yet on Iranian interests in Syria, where Israel has stepped up a long-running military campaign against Iran and groups it backs as the Gaza war has rippled around the Middle East. Until now, Iran has avoided directly entering the fray while supporting allies' attacks on Israeli and U.S. targets. Israel has not claimed responsibility for the attack, which, dest which destroyed a consular building adjacent to the main embassy complex in the upscale Meza district on Monday night, killing seven members of Iran's Revolutionary, er, Iran's Revolutionary Guards. That's the IRGC. Um, and this is from April 3rd, so just yesterday, and it was... Uh, um, I, I was just checking to see if Israel took... Uh, credit for this one yet, but I, I don't think that they have. So who knows what's going on with that? But uh, I don't doubt that it was them. They may just not want to say, yeah, we attacked an embassy in Syria because Hezbollah was using it as um, a base of operations, which is something they have a history of doing as well. They would do this with UN outposts um, monitoring ceasefires between Hezbollah and uh, and uh, and Israel. Um, they've been doing that for decades. They, they'd set up shop right in some of these um, UN outposts and start firing off rockets and try to get try to draw fire from the Israeli mil military um, and hopefully get like. Um, you know, casualties, uh, civilian casualties or UN casualties um, on uh, on that side. So uh, that's a tactic they've been up to for a long time. And anyway, it may this may be one of those situations where Israel is uh, just bombing the crap out of these generals. Um, they, they got two generals from uh, uh, from the uh, Quds Force, and um, um, they, they may just deny it because it took place in a uh, in an embassy. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, that's uh, a little bit of some just uh, my initial thoughts on the situation. Okay. The embassy, quote, was not a target, close quote, the official said. Iranian Supreme Lunar uh, Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, um, Ayatollah Ali Khomeini uh, vowed revenge. Quote, the Zionist regime will be punished by the hands of our brave men. We will make it regret this crime and others it has committed. Close quote, he said. Uh, Khomeini's political advisor, Ali uh, Shemkani, in a post on X of the United States, quote, remains directly responsible whether it was aware of the intention to carry out this attack. Close quote. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I throw the United States in there, but okay. Uh, according to X, well, I do. I mean, the United States is the great Satan and uh, Israel is the little Satan, according to the IRGC. According to the Ayatollahs, um, uh, according to Axios, citing, uh, citing a U.S. official, Washington told Tehran it quote had no involvement, close quote, uh, or advanced knowledge of the Israeli strike. The U.N. Secretary General Antonio uh, Guterres condemned the strike and called on quote all concerned to exercise utmost restraint and avoid further escalation that could lead to a broader conflict in an already volatile region. Close quote said spoke uh, his spokesperson said. Iranian state media said the death toll was 13, including six Syrians. Two security sources in Lebanon said at least one member of an Iranian-backed Lebanese group, Hezbollah, was killed in the strike. Syrian civil defense teams were still going on Tuesday to clear the rubble as ambulances were parked nearby. Iran's ambassador to Syria, Hossein Akbari, 
uh, who was not injured in the strike, said uh, the flattened building housed his residence. He could be seen. Uh, he could be seen exiting the main embassy building on Tuesday with his security guards. So, did they really hit the embassy, or was it, a, it just something like a, a building in the compound of the uh, the embassy? Um, da, 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 da. Okay, deterrence posture. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, Iran's United Nations mission said the attack was in violation of the quote foundational principle of the uh, inviolable uh, inviability of diplomatic and consular premises. Close quote. Uh, Akbari told Reuters it showed total disrespect for international law, and both Iran and Syria had the right to respond. Wafa Bader, a Meza resident, said she was home in the kitchen when she heard an enormous blast. Quote, I was knocked unconscious for about 10 minutes. We were so surprised by what happened. Both our cars are destroyed, she said. Um, and then they're going into a deterrence posture. I think that's probably good for that article there. But yeah, um, all kinds of uh, real mess going on over there right now. Um, so uh, you have uh, all these different proxies in these different countries all attacking Israel, um, and uh, well, it's not looking good right now. I mean, uh, in terms of um, the information wars, uh, it never does, of course, um, you know, uh, when we have a tragedy like this. And so here is Tedros Adenon. I don't know how to say his last name, but you know, Dr. Tedros. And he says, uh, the situation in Gaza is disastrous. Once again, WHO demands a ceasefire. Once again, we call for all hostages to be released and for lasting peace. Um, so I don't know, speaking out of both sides of his mouth, I guess, as we might expect, he's calling for a ceasefire, but um, of course they still have hostages. They're still holding hostages, Hamas is. So that would defeat the whole purpose, like leaving Hamas in charge and letting them keep the hostages would, would defeat the whole purpose of having um, the uh, the war and the invasion in the first place. And uh, so he's also saying release the hostages. <laughs> like if they release the hostages and surrender, the war would be over. So, um, all right, here is the video. He should At the moment, the situation looks disastrous. Since the conflict began, WHO has verified 906 attacks on healthcare in Gaza, the West Bank, Israel, and Lebanon, resulting in 736 deaths and 1,014 injuries. Only 10 of Gaza's 36 hospitals are still able to function even partially. WHO will continue to support those hospitals to deliver services as best they can. I repeat, hospitals must be respected and protected. They must not be used as battlefields. More than 33,000 people have now been killed in Gaza and almost 80,000 injured. We're seeing a very high burden of respiratory and skin infections and diarrheal illness. This Sunday marks six months since the conflict began. WHO welcomes last week's UN Security Council resolution demanding a ceasefire and we call for its immediate implementation. Once again, we call for all hostages to be released and for lasting peace. Ah, so empty virtue signal, I think, coming from uh, what Banks, I think, is apt aptly characterizing as uh, evil Tedros, communist war criminal. Uh, yeah, he is a commie war criminal and probably twice guilty of genocide now in light of the global pandemic and his mismanagement of it. Um, if it's if it's even mismanagement, uh, I think a lot of it is deliberate. Um, and uh, OK, so this is kind of the line that we've been seeing out of the progressive side, too, um, where they're kind of speaking out of both sides of their mouths. Uh, now they seem to be, uh, well, I mean, he's not even just progressive. He's probably like, uh, more like a communist overlord. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is kind of the line that they are taking. Um, and we can see that, uh, I'm just going to show some other examples here. Uh, this is Richard Marceau. He says, four unions call for Canada to suspend arms trade with Israel. Two of them, uh, QP, NAT, and PSAC. Uh, AFPC are already being taken to human rights tribunals for anti-Semitism and discrimination by Jewish members. No surprise there. Yeah, that is true. Um, we've covered that here before where, uh, you know, since all of this stuff uh, broke out with October 7th, um, we've seen kind of a lot of these unions showing um, their anti-Semitism. And that is because they are on the left. They are progressives and uh, progressivism is a movement to destroy the West. 
and uh, Israel is seen as a Western power in the Middle East. And so they use all the same propaganda narratives against them that they use on us, all the stuff about colonizers, conquerors, um, you know, uh, apartheid and, and all of that stuff. And here's Jonathan Kay. He says, uh, the sociology department at uh, Toronto Met has passed a resolution denouncing Israel, accusing it not only of genocide, but also several other sides, including uh, edgicide and scholasticide and epistemicide. Okay, so uh, yeah, there's all the made up words that we expect to come out of these Orwellian progressives. Um, so, uh, that is the position that apparently academia is taking as well, or, you know, this kind of pseudo academia that we have right now, indoctrination instead of education, so on and so forth. So, uh, yeah, the unions, the academy, um, they're all lining up on the progressive side and, uh, calling this genocide and this kind of thing. Um, here is Dr. Phil and... Uh, this is Never Again Live podcast, and they say Dr. Phil confronts two female Hamas propagandists on the question of whether the October 7th Hamas massacre would be considered genocide and whether it was morally acceptable. Joining Dr. Phil is Mosab Youssef, the son of Hamas leader. That's the son of Hamas founder. I've, uh, I, I show Mosab Hassan Youssef uh, his quotes and videos and stuff like that all the time. I think he's a very powerful voice in all of this. Um, continuing with the tweet, he also confronted the two keffiyeh wearing Hamas supporters and punched holes in their argument uh, that while pointing out their hypocrisy. OK, this is about a four and a half minute clip. I think I'm getting on in my programming here. Um, I hope we don't run too long for you guys, but uh, I might just let this go because uh, Dr. Phil has been on fire lately. Here he is. Recipients of that violence, and we are first asked to condemn violence. I find that there is a sense of hypocrisy in those questions when our suffering is not being recognized. And the first thing we're asked is to condemn. What do you think Israel was going to do when Hamas cuts a hole in the fence and comes over the top and kills 1,300 people? What did you think they should have done? I think they have every right to go in combat with Hamas, but I don't think they have the right for 92% of the death count to be civilians. If they burn an infant in a crib, do you see that as a moral equivalent to a collateral death from a bomb being dropped? As so That's a good question. I just want to put a correction in there. They're saying 92% of the deaths are civilian. That's not true, even by Hamas's own numbers. Um, it's about 50-50 and... Uh, two thirds women and children. So I, I find the numbers that Hamas are putting out there to be dubious. Um, and and I've shown some other things here where it's like the uh, the rate, the casualty rate, increases at a linear rate on on a graph. I've I've shown that here, and that's not how these things work. They tend to be a lot more erratic, where you have like these really bad days, and then these other days that aren't so bad. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it looks quite fabricated, um, and uh, it's it's. It's hard to tell, you know, what the uh, what the real casualties, what the real numbers look like when they're they're using human shields on the Hamas side, um, and uh, they have been lying from the very beginning. Um, I keep pointing to the example of the Al Shifa Hospital, but uh, it's not 92 percent are, are civilians. It's about 50 50, and two thirds are being reported as women and children. Um, but I, I, I would caution everybody on when it comes to uh, trusting the numbers coming out of Hamas. To a collateral death from a bomb being dropped as an act of war. They have explicitly targeted civilian areas that have been marked as civilian areas. Israel has the registry for every person in Gaza. And if that's where the enemy is hiding, do they have a right no, to attack them. No, they do not have the right to kill. There are some things that are just fundamental human decency. And when I ask you if what happened on October 7th is something you condemn and you say, well, you have to look at that by looking at hundreds of years of conflict. No, you don't. No, you don't. That's either right or it's wrong, and it was wrong, and I don't need a hundred years of conflict to know it was the wrong. The fact of the matter is that Hamas, yes, did take innocent life. Why did Hamas take away innocent life? Why was Hamas platformed? It says senior at uh, University of Michigan. Why was Hamas funded? Why is Hamas empowered to take away something. innocent life? Let me How tell you something. When somebody comes over a fence mm -hmm. and goes into someone's house mm -hmm. and burns their infant mm -hmm. in its crib, 
I don't give a damn why they did so it. Th it's wrong. <laughs> I've read it. That Most of Hassan Youssef here was, um, he, he looked like he was quite satisfied with uh, Phil's response there. At the charter of Hamas is to eliminate the Jewish race, beginning with Israel, but not stopping with Israel, wiping them off the face of the earth. Is that true? Now, um, this guy, like a bit of a personal hero of mine, I've seen him speak at the UN as well. Like I said, he was the son of the Hamas founder, went turncoat on Hamas, started working for the IDF and probably saved tens of thousands of lives from uh, suicide bombers during the second intifada. So uh, yeah, quite a hero. And he lives in um, California now. This is true, but it does not end there. Now we have the problem with the pro-Palestine who are actually given Hamas cover. They are participants in the crime. In fact, since October 7, I personally don't differentiate between Hamas and what so-called Palestinians. Because actually there is no Palestinians. There are uh, tribes. There is the tribe of Hamas, and there is the tribe of the Islamic Jihad, and there is the tribe of Khalil, and there is the tribe of Nablus. I say the same things, guys. Like, um politics is tribal and that's what they're doing in canada right now is they're balkanizing us into tribes so we can be um like every bit as um collaborative as we see in the uh in the middle east and each one has different uh, interests and all of them are conflicted if they did not have israel as the common enemy they would kill each other this is the reality you of what so-called Palestine. You don't know what Palestine is. Actually, in fact, the kefiyah that you are wearing, mm -hmm. this is just a statement to show that you really lack the authenticity to represent the case. And what so-called the cause, mm -hmm. you know, this is a human problem. So you just... The cause must die. I think enough is enough. And now it's proven and you are helping Hamas to prove it to the world that Palestine depends on the destruction of the state of Israel. And this is not acceptable and we are not going to agree to it. And I tell you something, for the next 10 or 20 years, the Palestinian people will pay the bill that Hamas is caused today and most likely in blood. To you, Hamas and Palestinians are, are the same. They're one and the same. After October 7, yes, there is no difference. Really? This is what I call Arab level based right here. Really? The vast majority of the Palestinian people support Hamas. Really? This is a fact. This is proven by statistics and your silence now. You are not even, you cannot even condemn Hamas and say that what they did on October 7 was an act of a savage group. You don't have that power. Said I condemn on what authority question. do you speak? You only speak on the authority of Hamas propaganda. No, I'm so why do you say that I'm speaking on the authority of Hamas propaganda? Because if I'm you were a decent human being, you can say that the thousands were killed on October 7. That was a crime against humanity. It was a genocide. It, uh... well, something like an attempt at a genocide. And uh, Hamas does have genocidal attentions. And he's, he's right to point that out, Phil, um, that that's right in their charter, right? Uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That's um, you know, a, a euphemism for um, wiping out Israel and uh, and the Jews. I think they actually had something in there about driving the Jews into the sea at one point. Um, and there is that line that they quote from the Quran from the Day of Judgment, uh, where the where the trees will cry out, the trees and the rocks will cry out, "Oh, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him." Um, all over the trees except for one. Apparently, it's a Jewish tree or something like that. Um, of that. But, uh, yeah, so uh, Arab level based. I can see <laughs> some some folks are enjoying it. Uh, as you're saying, based legend here. Uh, Cindy is saying uh, bravo and uh, give her. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if, if anybody, this guy, <laughs> Jesus, I mean, like he, um, uh, he, his, his life is going to be under threat for for you know the rest of his uh his days so um if anybody is in a position to really speak on this it's it's this courageous uh -huh. man um 
most awesome use of. So, um, okay. And here is uh, another line. You heard all the stuff there about the colonialism that was coming out of that university student and, and whatnot. Um, here is, uh, well, Nikki Ashton is tweeting out first nations have located evidence of over 2,300 children in suspected unmarked graves near residential schools. Communities need to support, uh, need support to bring their children home. And Jonathan Kay is retweeting this. And he says, three years, zero graves. So everybody around here probably remembers this. Uh, this was the Kamloops Residential School line. Now, there were a couple of different schools that did this. One school has actually done um, the uh, excavation of the site. Uh, these were the sites where they had the ground penetrating radar, which is an exaggeration of what radar really does. All it does is detect soil disruptions where they can say that this section of soil has been disturbed at some point relative to the surrounding soil. Um, and uh, most like the best uh, explanation that I've seen is coming from True North, where they say that it was probably a septic bed that was installed or dug up at some point um, at the Kamloop school. But one school that did the excavation found rocks in the basement, not children's bodies. Um, but that soil disruption was pushed by the mainstream as evidence of Canada being a genocidal state. So you can see how, um, you know, this is the communist narrative, uh, communist, progressive, but I repeat myself, narrative with respect to the West. It's all part of the PSYOP and the shaming tactics, the Maoist shaming tactics that they deploy against us. Um, and here are progressives in Canada saying the same thing about us that everybody says about Israel. We know that since that time, communities have located evidence of more than 2,300 children in sus suspected unmarked graves at or near former residential schools and Indian hospitals. Communities need answers. They need to be able to bring their children home. Here in northern Manitoba, communities like Cross Lake, Apasquiat Cree Nation, Norway House, Saging, and others need answers. That's why three years ago I supported the call of Chief Monias, Councillor Robinson, and others to invite the International Commission of Missing Persons to Canada to aid them in their search for these children. Unfortunately, Canada's response has been less than acceptable. They got back to us with a form letter. Despite the commitments to truth, to reconciliation, and the understanding of, of the absolute uh, moment that we were in, given the, the, uh, the news out of Kamloops. Almost three years later, Canada has done very little to support Pimichikamak's call and the work that it has done, uh, along with others, with the ICMP. Maybe this person is genuinely oblivious to the fact that this is all lies. Um, because if Canada responded appropriately, we would have had a full forensic accounting of what happened by now. And if there were, if there ever was a mass grave of children somewhere in Canada, we would probably have a monument erected with their names on it by now. So um, she seems to be naively <laughs> pressuring the government of Canada to take such action um, that would absolutely falsify her narrative. We now know that the federal government, the liberal government, is planning to sunset programs in Indigenous services and Crown Indigenous services uh, that also include this area, seeking truth when it comes to the burial grounds around residential schools. This is unacceptable. Cross Lake's call, the call made by other First Nations and other Indigenous communities must be heard. Their desire to work with the ICMP, a world leader when it comes uh, to uh, uh, unmarked graves and seeking truth, must be supported by Canada, by the federal government. Okay, so there you go. We're... Uh... We're genocidal here in Canada as well. And Shiloh over on Rubble is just saying, uh, sorry, I'm very late, Sergeant Major. I know, 20 push-ups it is. All right, great job, man. Great. Uh, way to own it. Way to own it, brother. So uh, uh, I appreciate you being here. And, uh, geez, I hope it's not, I uh, hope that time change isn't uh, too much of an inconvenience for you there, bro. I appreciate having you around, but uh, feel free to let me know. Um, here is uh, Chanel Fall on uh, X, and they're saying, watch how city councillors at the city of Quesnel react when Dr. Francis Widowson uh, asks 
them a simple question relating to misinformation about unmarked graves on their record. After some effort to discredit her and evade the question, counselors Scott Elliott and Lori Ann Rudenberg tell her they don't want to hear from her. She is not welcome there. Uh, the crowd cheers. Burn the witch. <laughs> this is the woke mind virus in all its glory. Those uh, afflicted become absolutely convinced that their quote-unquote noble cause justifies their intolerance and evil acts. Yes, very much so. Um, woke, willingly overlooking known evils, um, uh, particularly communism. Uh, they refuse to see that they have become the oppressors they claim to oppose. Quote, the greatest tyrannies are always perpetu uh, perpe uh, perpetuated in the name of the noblest causes. Close quote, Thomas Paine. Uh, great quote and uh, great comment from this guy. But let's uh, check out the hysteria. Please state your name and your community where you're from. So just for a point of clarification, how many questions are we allowed to ask? It's supposed to be a comment or a question. Okay. Uh, my name is Francis Widowson. I'm, uh, I'm a professor. Uh, I was a professor at Mount Royal University. And I am a senior fellow with the Frontier Center for Public Policy and a board please member let, for the society. Please let the individual ask the question or state the comment. Thank you. Uh, and I'm a board member for the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. My question is about the attachment or the item concerning the press release, the news uh, release from the British Columbia Assembly of First Nations. On this press release, it states that uh, the Tekemlitz Shepetwik, uh, the Kamloops Band, first brought forward evidence of unmarked graves at the site of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School in 2021. Point of order. If she has a question to that organization, she needs to... No, I have, an, I, have a, I have a question about this being read into the record here. Does the council concern itself with misinformation? Is it opposed to misinformation being spread and entered into the record? If so, does it agree that this is misinformation because there is no evidence of uh, unmarked graves at the Kamloops Indian Residential School? So okay. do you agree Point of that order, misinformation we will should be spread your in your records? Question. Councillor Rudenberg, would you like to take so a stab at that? So this is a question coming from a tenured professor who was actually fired from her role in the Departments of Economics, Justice and Policy Study. Excommunicated from the cult, obviously, for blasphemy, right? At Mount Royal in Calgary following allegations of workplace harassment and intimidation. And this, this is the shaming um, that uh, we're, we're seeing. This is Maoism in action here. This was during con controversy. This happened around comments she made on how residential schools had positive educational benefits and when she questioned if the abuse that occurred actually equates to cultural genocide as described in the Truth and Reconciliation Act. You really have no place here asking your questions. We really don't want to hear from you. So evidence, is there, is there any evidence? Um, is, or, well, there, there is no evidence. So, um, I, you know, can you show me the evidence? Shame on you for asking for evidence. You didn't answer my question. You didn't answer my question. Do you think that the council should be spreading misinformation? Point of order, Mr. Chair. Her opinion in this in this chambers does not count. She's asking us to comment on something that comes from qualified individuals that dealt with this, that lived through this. Ma'am, you are not welcome here. These things are just out of control. So you're not going to answer my question. So you're not going to answer the question. Is that correct? This is a pretty courageous woman here. Like, man, oh, man, is she ever handling herself well? Okay. The question. Do you agree that the council should spread misinformation? There is no evidence of unmarked graves at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And we need to have the report released from the Bolio report. Mr. Chair, and we there need is to no have question here. I ask that we just stop her from are needed talking. To make that determination. Answer my question. Do you agree that you should spread misinformation? There is no answer to this question. 
Mr. Chair, I'd move for adjournment. Most transparent government everywhere. I mean, I know this isn't the federal government, but uh, this is what we're seeing across the board. Um, you know, it's uh, like, like, I, like I'm like i always saying, like uh, she blasphemes the woke dogma. So they just cry heresy and go for the pitchforks. Um, and here is N Wokeness and their tweeting out University of Texas was forced to lay off 60 DEI employees after SB 17 passed. Nature is healing. <laughs> Okay, so it uh, looks like, uh, well, several states are cracking down on the DEI stuff. Uh, Florida, now Texas, um, and uh, here we go. I cried, um, and I was angry. A lot of people are, are upset. All of my group chats are raging, all of the group me's, all of the slacks, everybody is, is raging. They say the people and experiences close to them are being ripped away. According to our partners at the American Statesman, at least 60 staff members who were previously in DEI roles have been notified that their last day is at the end of the semester. In a letter to the UT community, President Jay Harsel wrote in part, quote, to reduce overlap, we are closing the division of campus and community engagement and redistributing the remaining programs, end quote. That division used to be DEI related and like similar departments had to change its name in January because of the new law. This is just Texas. Texas does not want us here. Texas has never wanted us here. Christiana McAfee with the Black Student Alliance says a lot of the DEI related jobs are filled with people who look like her. Cultural Marxist, big surprise. Um, and Stephanie is dumping a bunch of really good links around the uh, the uh, um, residential schools narrative there, the, uh, the mass grave narrative in particular that is. So uh, check out her comments, guys. She looks like she's putting some good articles up most of us black students these are our only letters of recommendation these are the only people that we can get close enough with to build a further relationship with us a lot of them were just there for me and gave me a lot of resources and were always there uh when i was unsure of what to do or if i just wasn't feeling right about something yeah uh and who was just saying cora was saying people being moved by emotion rather than logic that is kind of the whole problem in the nutshell and that's what that's how propaganda works don't forget okay like always ask yourself um are they are they manipulating my emotions or are they are are they appealing to my intellect because that is how propaganda works is it manipulates your emotions um drives you into a radical frenzy um, and uh, we we see the impacts of that, especially in the younger generations who are being indoctrinated instead of educated. Um, and so it's just hysterics across the board. Okay, and here is Circulon. I like this guy's account. Uh, Circulon, he's got the uh, eight times jabbed, triple masked, um, the uh, Ukrainian flag, pride flag. Well, I think the, the two different pride flags, cricket and UN, is... <laughs> in his uh his uh, username there so that's fantastic and he says what do you see we see white supremacy sexism racism built into a patriarchal colonial system designed by the settlers to oppose women and minorities uh yeah and he's tweeting on a graphic here these are the mayors of all the various canadian the major cities in canada it's toronto that's um uh, what's her, what's her name there? Anyway, everybody is a minority except for maybe the, the Montreal mayor here. Um, she looks like a regular French lady, Vancouver, um, Oriental, Calgary, Brown, Edmonton, Brown, Toronto, Oriental. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, not lost. The irony is not lost on us when we're being accused of white supremacy, sexism, and racism built into a patriarchal colonial system. Um, and everywhere you look, it's, uh, minorities who are, you know, in these uh, offices of prestige. Here is lips of TikTok. And they say, wow, one of Canada's top medical schools, Queen's Health, has announced they will discriminate against white people. They have special programs called Car uh, QUARMS, which is an, quote, accelerated route to medical school, close quote. And the qualifications are you must be black or indigenous. White people have to go through medical school the regular way. So on the one side, you know, the soft bigotry of low expectations puts uh, people like Jody Gondek in charge and she's the first Canadian mayor, I think, to be recalled right now. She got booed at the Calgary Flames game um, not too long ago, which was fantastic to see. So, um, you know, we have uh, a lot of people who are underqualified and inept being um, elevated to these positions of power uh, through that intersectional Marxist lens of um, 
of uh, DEI. And like James Lindsay says, uh, DEI has to die. And then on the other end, uh, we have some people getting into these uh, highly technical fields like medicine, uh, where people's uh, lives are on the line. And uh, here's what it says. It says, uh, candidates for the Quorum's pathway must meet the following criteria, be a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident of Canada, and identify as Black African, Black Caribbean, Black North American, or a multiracial person who has and identifies with their Black ancestry and or Indigenous. Well, at least you only have to identify as one, guys. So as long as you, uh, as long as you say you identify as a black, black or Indigenous person, you can get into med school. Now, um, <laughs> some of the younger generations are starting to wake up to this. So white people are evil, racist, awful, incompetent, and we need women and minorities to save our civilization. Um, and uh, here is the Joe, Ra Joe Rogan Experience Companion. And uh, he's tweeting out, she's awesome. Try to stick it out. It gets better and better. Okay, so um, some of the uh, younger generations who've been indoctrinated into this nonsense, I think, are uh, getting a rude awakening um, as they become more and more in touch with the world. And I thought this was rather entertaining. So um, here is... Uh, mm -hmm. He took me back to his house, not because he wanted to do anything, because he wanted to show me the renovations he's doing in his basement. <laughs> You do go to basements on a first date, Reagan. I know, but he had barn doors. <laughs> he had a, he was making a whole other apartment all by himself. <laughs> he bought this house. And he has a car. And it's nice. And his car did you see his car? No. It's twenty it's brand new. It's a twenty twenty one SUV. It's beautiful. <laughs> It has a screen in it. <laughs> screen. Yeah. I started to bit of forget about like everything else, and I was just like, "Wow, I could start living like this." <laughs> and he was so respectful. <laughs> it was beautiful. So. Uh... <laughs> Do you think you're going to go on a second date? He wants me. He wants to bring me to his hockey game tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to pick me up and bring me to his hockey game. <laughs> so I can come watch him. It's so cute. <laughs> he says he wants to take me thrifting beforehand. So we, yeah. So we can pick out outfits for each other and not let each other see. And it's what we have to wear on our next day. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> that, that sounds like a pretty good first date, right? <laughs> my first white guy my first white guy <laughs> that's what she said uh. <laughs> i mean no offense but <laughs> i think i kind of been missing out <laughs> he has a house at 25 years old i'm only 22 and i don't know what i'm doing <laughs> But I think I might want to move in. <laughs> it's nice. It's cute. I can get used to it. <laughs> All right. So there you go. Uh, maybe we're not so rotten anymore. Hey, or, or, we're not so rotten after all. Hey, white guys. Uh, okay. And here is uh, Amy Ham. So. Um, like I said at the beginning of the program, wokeness hurts women. This is Amy Ham from uh, BC. Uh, she's been fighting a lot of the uh, transgender ideology and, um, you know, the, the COVID stuff as well. She's, uh, of course, being defamed and stuff by her professional. But she's a nurse. I saw her at the uh, Free Speech and Medicine Conference. Um, see if I can get her on for an interview here sometime. I, uh, I reached out to her. But uh, <laughs> to say she's waking up from the woke nightmare. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, <laughs> and Stephanie is saying she is not ready to be a trophy wife. Um, 
yeah, you know, she should probably work on herself quite a bit. She's pretty young. I think 22, it says, uh, before she uh, jumps into the, the trophy life <laughs> uh, role. Okay. And uh, so, uh, but, you know, I would say that that is the kind of harm that's being done to, to woke women. It's an impediment to their happiness, This uh, the wokeness. Um, you know, it just breeds bitter, resentful, odious women um and uh hopefully that young woman is uh, coming to her senses before it's too late uh but um uh and and of course uh well there, there are various ways i think that uh, wokeness really hurts women but let's see what amy amy ham has to say it says troubling truths about the male female divide on a uh, radical progressive hogwash a majority of Canadians reject quote-unquote wokeness, according to recent polls, but more than that, a new paper in the Scandinavian Journal of Psychology reveals something else, a male-female dichotomy. It is women who, for unclear reasons, disproportionately promulgate and buttress such progressive ideology. These findings are not surprising to anyone who has loudly opposed the politics of woke, uh, myself included, and who has largely... Uh, female wrath, and who has had largely female wrath visited upon them for their heresy. Uh, you know, I think that um, we, the, the the human survival strategy is bifurcated along gender lines. Um, you know, men uh, tend to um, they, they tend to seek status like when women are attracted to um, to wealth and status. Um, men are attracted to youth and beauty. Um, men tend to value uh, freedom, independence. Women tend to value uh, safety and security. It has everything to do with the fact that our babies are basically born prematurely um, because of the narrow birth canal that's created by the upward posture. Our, our hips are actually, uh, they connect um, on the bottom of the pelvis as opposed to the side like other primate species do to accommodate the upright posture. And we have these massive brains and this tiny little birth canal. Um, and uh, so uh, the the way that evolution has overcome that is to basically give birth to babies prematurely and they're totally helpless. And so women are in, a, in the ancestral environment um, entirely encumbered with newborns um, and they have to breastfeed and stay with them basically 100% of the time. And so um, they uh, they tend to um, seek, uh, they, they tend to be attracted to men who can um, assure the survivability of their offspring by providing safety, security. Um, uh, they're, they're good at getting resources, self-sacrifice, um, chivalry, that kind of thing. So they, they women tend to um, tend to um, kind of accumulate over on the left, the collectivist mindset. Right. Because what, what are the collectivists always saying? Like safety and security. That's us. Like we're, we're the ones who are going. Justin Trudeau is always talking about keeping Canadians safe and and uh, and stuff like this. Um, so, yeah, I tend to think I, I tend to think that men and women vote in line with their mating strategies. Essentially, men tend to lean more towards the right. Women tend to lean more to, more, more towards the left. Um, and it just has everything to do with inherent differences between the sexes. Um, okay, so uh, back to the article here. Women should reject leftist radicalism. We suffer because of it. Instead, we promote it at work, in universities, in politics, our communities, and at home. We are the primary drivers of woke hogwash. This admission is both humiliating and enraging, but it's true. Canadian institutions are beholden to the most female, uh, to mostly female minority, and uh, not only bore us to tears. Uh, care to hear another personalized land acknowledgement, anyone, but terrorizes us at the mere scent of wavering fealty. That's because it's a cult. Um, quote unquote, wokeness has been described as everything from political epithet for uh, boogeyman of the extreme left to a catch all for any cause whatsoever that concerns itself with the well being of an identifiable group. A more reasonable definition borrowed from political scientist Yashe Monk uh, is that wokeness is a version of social justice based on what he terms, quote, the identity synthesis, close quote. It views human beings not as individuals, but as a collection of group identities that are either oppressed or oppressive. And to be oppressed is to be virtuous. To be a victim is to hold precious social cachet. Um, the more oppressed one is, the better the person they are, the more we should all be forced to cater to their very whimsical desire. It goes without saying that wokeness is a race to the bottom of human dignity, potential, and uniqueness. Well said. Um, one term I think I would have included in that paragraph would be cultural Marxism. 
um, the oppressor oppressed. It's got everything to do with Marxism. Wokeness has infiltrated every aspect of our society, from education to employment and sports, yet it is women who suffer the most severe consequences. We are the ones who have lost our private spaces and sports categories. Our girls are expected to undress and change rooms with grown, intact males. Uh, complaints are not permitted. We've been accomplices in silencing ourselves, demonizing ourselves, and cheering on those who wish to refer to us and by our body parts or functions. That any woman accepts, quote, uterus owner, close quote, or, quote, chest feeder, close quote, as uh, something other than misogynistic tripe is incomprehensible, utter nonsense. Why would we do this to ourselves? The Scandinavian researchers refer to an emergent and global public discourse on quote unquote woke as a debate that has been quote largely data free, close quote. In response, they crunched numbers from two studies to reveal the huge sex divide on the subject. The authors retitled quote unquote woke with academic flourish as quote critical social justice attitudes, close quote, and who holds these attitudes the most? Women, of course, more than twice as often as men. In saner times, the statements the researchers used to uh, gauge public sentiment would read as bad parody, uh, but we, uh, we do not live in sane times. Um, study participants were asked to agree or disagree with everything from, quote, university reading lists should include fewer white or European authors, close quote, and, quote, the ideas of Karl Marx should not have more influence in national politics, close quote, to, quote, there are no biological differences between men and women, close quote. The statements were selected, oft used opinions espoused by the shills of intersectional feminism, queer theory, and postcolonial theory, among others. Uh, postmodernism is uh, is the, the current iteration of uh, cultural Marxism. Um, okay. Uh, the, the resulting analysis concluded these ideas had, quote, little to no support from men, close quote, but, quote, a moderate, close, close quote, uh, support from women. The authors did not support an explanation and suggested future studies examine why women are, quote, unquote, woker than men. Why is this happening? Does far left ideology fill a void in certain women? What is that void? Is it that droves of Western women are deciding not to have children? Uh, are we replacing babies with, quote, oppressed people, close quote? Is it simply in our female nature to be drawn in by a lure of what some see as virtuous compassion for the downtrodden? Uh, yeah, that's a factor, I think, as well. Um, there is ample evidence that empathy is a biological and sex-differentiated phenomenon rooted, unsurprisingly, in the female role of motherhood. And while modern feminist theory has it that divergent behaviors between the sexes are always taught and enforced, socially constructed, as they say, scant evidence supports such a claim. Of course, scant evidence supports such a claim, um, because you can look anywhere in the animal kingdom and see similar trends in sexually dimorphic species, which is the majority of them, uh, especially mammals. Female compassion is an enticing explanation for all of this. However, if we accept that women embrace wokeness because of their relatively more empathetic nature, a new problem emerges. Why, when women are shown the naked truth, sometimes literally, a la exhib exhibitionist males in our private spaces, about the harms of this ideology, do they simply not denounce it? Why do they want to stick around to find out the next degrading moniker they're expected to refer to themselves by? If, quote, front hole haver, close quote, doesn't inspire all women in a vicious rage, I can't imagine what will. Uh, there's something more going on. If women possess an evolutionarily superior sense of compassion, it doesn't make sense that so many of us would happily give our daughters rights to fair sports or sex-segregated spaces, our, um, or accept that female rape victims should shut up about the males inside their refuges. Um, they are not compassionate or empathetic things to do. Um, no, they're not. But uh, if you're woke, then they are because these people, the transgenders, are higher up on the intersectional hierarchy of oppression than um, biological women. Uh, so uh, they, 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 um, biological women must yield to um, those who outclass them on that hierarchy of oppression. Okay. Some claim that a uh, cabal of wealthy, powerful men is taking advantage of women's good nature and manipulating us into wokeness. This claim is neither compelling nor complementary of female intelligence. Quite the opposite. To argue that Machiavellian men have the prowess to control our thoughts and actions necessitates our entire sex being stupid. We need to admit instead that a subset of women is complicit in this culture-destroying, thought-terminating scourge. There is a deep cruelty in radical progressiveness. To woke persons, others can only be saintly or evil, uh, nothing in between. 
It evokes the psychology of the in-group, out-group dynamic, which curiously is a dynamic more often enforced by females. In psychology studies, women have also been shown to demonstrate higher degrees of malevolence when compared with males. Uh, perhaps this is the uncomfortable answer needed to explain the male-female wokeness divide. Perhaps it is not a tendril of our good nature that makes women woker but, uh, than men, but merely a reflection of our darker, malicious side. Yeah, I mean, Florence Nightingale and the devouring mother and... Uh, uh, like child, uh, child abuse, women, women actually abuse, uh, like, uh, children are, are most vulnerable in single mother households, even like single father households are safer environments for children statistically. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a dark and complex, uh, picture really that, uh, you know, requires a much more nuanced view, I think on human nature than the wokesters are willing to accept. Uh, uh, whatever it happens to be, what's clear is that we need more women to demonstrate the courage of their convictions and denounce the destructive far left dogma that is running roughshod over the majority of Canadians. Thank you, Amy, Amy Ham. That is uh, a pretty courageous position to be taking. And here is Darren Grimes, and he's saying his name is Adam, Ga uh, Adam Graham. He is a male double rapist no government will ever compel me to refer to this scumbag as a woman and this is isla bryslin transgender rapist jailed for eight years um i didn't go and dig up the original story here this uh this graphic i think suffices for the purpose of making my point that wokeness harms women and uh it's not really just my point it's also amy ham's wokeness hurts women i say harms um but uh why do so many support it okay so here's another example right so um, we have these young women that are um, very much confused about how to find happiness. And we have some of these older women that are fed up with this crap. And uh, also we have, you know, these women having to share their spaces with um, convicted rapists. And here's Elon Musk. And here is uh, one of the way, one of the most ultimate harms I think is done to Young women in particular, adolescent females, Elon Musk is tweeting out, I'm cool with adults doing whatever they want so long as it doesn't harm others, but kids need to be protected at all costs. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I agree with absolutely everything in that statement. That is uh, a, a glorious statement, and I couldn't have said it better myself. He's retweeting Ian Miles Chong, who says, the vast majority of gender-confused or quote-unquote gender-questioning children grow out of it according to a 15-year longitudinal study conducted in the Netherlands, which tracked more than 2,700 children from age of 11 into their mid-20s. Being transgender is a trend. It's a phase. Some kids go through and eventually grow out, including those who undergo irreversible surgeries. The surgeries, the treatments, the therapies all need to stop immediately. Yeah, uh, this is uh, the sickest thing that's ever happened in Canada. And... Um, the uh and it's wokeness right and these are some of the most vulnerable people among us adolescent girls um who uh have a nasty tendency to kind of get swept up in whatever happens to be trendy at any given moment and right now it is trans trenderism that uh that tops the trend list um so uh yeah pretty sad sick stuff but um at least the uk like we're starting to see in europe and the uk they're turning this around it's north america that's behind the curve on this one here um, so, uh, hopefully this is a, a harbinger of things to come, um, that the UK is turning things around. And this is the article here. I don't think I'll read the whole thing. I'm already kind of way over my time. I'm off my game now that I'm back in the evenings. Um, but, uh, here is the Veterans for Freedom website, everybody. So you can go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter by clicking subscribe here. Join Veterans for Freedom if you're a veteran by clicking join here and support Veterans for Freedom by clicking support here. You can donate to our operational costs to help me pay for my StreamYard account and the website by clicking donate, or you can support and or you can support the uh, Veterans for Freedom Support Fund with a monthly credit card donation that you can sign up for with, by clicking one of these buttons here. And if you don't want to use your credit card, you can send your e-transfer to fund at veteransforfreedom.ca. So that's fund at veterans number four freedom.ca, preferably with your auto deposit enabled. But if you're not able to do that, please use the password fund for freedom. That's all caps fund number four, all caps freedom. And we'll make sure that gets off to a worthy cause. Um, last month's uh, winner of the uh, who got the most votes 
votes from the people who donated was Carrie Sakamoto, who's been vaccine injured. I had her on the program here a couple of weeks ago, and she did a very touching video thanking us for the support. So um, yes, whatever you're able to give uh, is very much appreciated, and we'll make sure that that gets off to a worthy cause indeed. And that brings us all the way back to Epictetus, who says, the greater the difficulty, the more glory in surmounting it. Well, we have a hell of a lot of glory uh, ahead of us there, folks, because uh, these are some challenges. I don't think that uh, previous generations um, ever ever foresaw coming, really. I mean, you know what? And in a way, we, we do have it better than previous generations, too. You got you to gotta look at previous fourth turnings like the Second World War, the American Civil War, the American Revolution, the Salem Witch Trials. Um, so uh, we're out here fighting a meme war and an ideological war and... Phew, I mean, we all pray that it, it doesn't go hot, especially uh, kinetic, that is, with the Chinese Communist Party and uh, the Islamunists taking over uh, North America and the West. So, um, but anyway, uh, as it stands right now, um, I think uh, we're, we're, we're stacking up the wins. We'll probably see a setback sometime before the end of the year, but uh, the momentum is turning in our favor. So uh, let's just make sure that we uh, we remember that the greater the difficulty, the more glory in surmounting it. All right. And uh, Brenda says, uh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Brenda, for being with us. I appreciate it. And uh, Debbie says, great show. Thank you, Debbie. Stephanie says, I am <laughs> uh, I am going to get banned, aren't I? You? Never. What's, what's going on? Why would you get banned? Um, because you're sharing a book recommendation. It says... Uh, Feminist Mistake, Radical Feminism Culture ebook. Um, I am into that stuff. I did a lot of rating on feminism like uh, around the mid-2000s and stuff like that. Feminism was like the gateway drug for me. That was the one. There's a, a book. It's on my shelf. It's called um, Spreading Misandry. Misandry as in hatred of males. You know, like misogyny is hatred of females and uh, misandry is the uh, hatred of males. But the fact that you don't know the word misandry and you do know the word misogyny says everything you really need to know about the current discourse around gender issues, doesn't it? Um, but it was that book. It was written uh, by, what's her name? Catherine, I forget. Uh, Paul Nathanson and Catherine Young of, Uni of uh, Universities of McGill and I don't remember the other, Queens, I think. Queens and McGill, respectively. Um, they're, uh, it, and, and it's legit. That was the first time that uh, the idea of cultural Marxism was proposed to me. That was what they said in uh, Spreading Misandry is not only does third wave feminism, uh, is, it, is it culturally Marxist, but it shows all the signs of being a religion as well. And, and as I started to understand uh, more about that, I started to see other forms of cultural Marxism crop up everywhere. So um, some uh, feminism is is kind of a gateway in that regard, I think. The third wave stuff, at least, third and fourth wave. Cindy says, thanks, Jeff, as always. Have a great week, uh, night all. Hashtag winning. Yes, indeed. Marion says, have a good night all. And Aj says, uh, thanks, Jeff. Great show and practice sounds of silence. I'm sure you would rock it. Uh, <laughs> sure, I got lots of time. <laughs> That's, but uh, yeah, that was great. Um, Patricia says, good show, Jeff, as always, and gives me the uh, the hearts. Have a good night, everyone. Cora says, thanks again, Jen. Everyone remember to uh, email the man who is holding 40 million Canadians hostage and give him a piece of your mind. Release our people. And Julie says, uh, she's going to miss the hearts, um, Jeff Avery. Stephanie says, thanks, Jeff. P.S. I love males, especially Caucasians. <laughs> right on. Um, at least somebody does. I, I know you guys do, for sure. Um, and, uh, I want to be, uh, an American, uh, says, uh, on, on rubble says we are the best. Um, you know, I kind of want to be an American too. Uh, I was going to take off for the United States when I retired from the military, but there's, I don't know. I just can't help myself. There's still a hell of a fight. Uh, we got a hell of a fight on our hands here in Canada and we got to hold this ground, right? Uh, our ancestors sacrificed to give us all these uh, adventures in Canada or all these uh, advantages here in Canada. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I decided to stay. It's just so I could have this fight. <laughs> I'm a sucker for punishment. All right, guys, that's it for me for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. And until next time, stay frosty and stay safe. Won't you help to sing? These songs of freedom It's all I ever have Damn songs